Chapter 16 Entrepreneur Six years earlier, and far away, somewhere on the edge of a different isola altogether, a man wakes up. The year is seventy-two. He's all alone. It's cold in his tarpaulin tent, and the morning is dark. Curled up in his sleeping bag, he rubs his sides to get warm. His wool sweater, worn thin, scratches against his skin. It gets the blood flowing, and the man finally dares to stick his hand out of the warmth of his sleeping bag. He wears woolen fingerless gloves, even when he sleeps. It's a common trick in his profession. He rummages around on the floor, finds his flashlight in the dark, and fiddles with the frozen switch for half a minute. Finally, the light bulb flickers on. The electric light is so crummy that it barely illuminates the one-man tent. The man sits up cross-legged in his sleeping bag and breathes on his fingers to warm his hands, his toothless mouth quivering. In the flashlight beam, on the inside of the tent, there is a stamp bearing the name of the manufacturer, Cooperative Mirocosmos. The man puts his hand against the tarpaulin. It's cold, and the insulated tent has sunk in under the weight of the snow. Not the slightest bit of light seeps in from outside, and he doesn't even hear the whistling of the wind. The storm had died down during the night. An electronic wristwatch shows that today is his birthday. He's thirty-nine years old. It's seven-fifteen in the morning. The man climbs out of his sleeping bag and, crouching in the Miracosmos tent, pulls his anorak coat over his sweater and slips his feet into lace-up boots. The zipper squeaks open and, just like that, legs bare, he steps out of the tent and straight into the pail. Twenty kilometers past the edge of the world, it's snowing quietly. In the dim morning light, the wreck of a man limps a few steps away from his snow-covered tent to stand beneath a bare tree. All around him, from the black and white dream of the taiga landscape, the fanged mountainsides and the ghostly frills of Koshat spruce trees emerge. Through the snow and fog, a faint blue seeps into the colorless world, where the radius of visibility ends. It's morning. It doesn't get any brighter here. And in the middle of it, opposite the gnarled tree, stands a completely destroyed human being. He is an entrepreneur. He's an aging rocker. His name is Sigismund Berg. He wears dark blue boxers with a white hem, and he's taking a piss. The camp is located on a hillside terrace surrounded by spruce trees. Even in the misty distance of the valley below, the clattering echoes of a snow shovel can be heard as the entrepreneur digs out the front of his tent. And then, the repeated chunks of an axe. Sigismund Berg comes back to the tent across the clearing with a handful of branches from a barren tree. Thick snowflakes drift in the air. The man had pulled on what's left of a pair of worn-down jeans and, while he was working, had unbuttoned his anorak coat and put his hood back on his shoulders. Now he stands still, just like that. Something had moved in the pail, right in front of him. Silence. It is this silence from which all other silences are derived. The entrepreneur inhales sharply, the sound of his breathing, the roar of blood in his ears, is so loud that it interferes with his hearing. The kindling shifts in his lap. He stands motionless, his back slightly hunched as always. Even the snowfall stops when the pale stands still with him. Minutes pass. The counter on his electronic wristwatch freezes at 7.48. There is a sound of hooves stepping on the granite, right in front of him, on a rock on higher ground. 
An ebex steps out of the pale. Zigismund stares at him intently, and the ebex looks back at Zigismund. They both have dark eyes, moist from the cold. Zigismund Berg has a receding hairline and the ponytail of an aging rocker. The alpha male has a huge crown of horns. In the pale behind the animal, his herd glides along and pushes uphill, colorless silhouettes, straight legs flexing on their hooves. The horns of the Kozorogs are wrapped in the pale like the spearheads of a passing army. Puffs of steam rise from the kid's snorting nostrils. They go alongside the females, and the king himself goes last. The ebex sways his crown of horns side to side and recedes into the pale. He leaves the entrepreneur standing there, alone. Don't go, says Zigismund, in his pitiful drunkard voice. Please, don't go. He drops the kindling and clambers up the snowy stone wall. His fingerless gloves slide off the granite. His feet can't find a foothold. Panting, he stumbles through the pale, among the dwarf spruces. There's nothing there anymore. Everyone's gone. What are you still looking for up here, you bozo? Don't go, please don't go. You're like that old man. You know, the one that goes to the park to spend time with the squirrels. Little Mickey, come here, Mickey. The need for closeness is just so deadly. He can't manage. But I'm so alone. You are never alone, Ziggy. You have yourself. 21 years ago, on an evening during winter break, Ziggy stands at the horse car stop. In two days, the 51st year will become the 52nd. The Vossen suburb sleeps around him. It's already late, and it's dark outside, but he's not in a hurry to be anywhere. His mother isn't expecting him home. The boy weaves back and forth on the tram stop's wooden bench, the zippers jingling on his leather jacket. His backdrop, the high picket fence of the plot by the road, is a permanent reminder of private property. It pisses him off. He had just come back from selling gear to rich kids, and shortly before that, he had performed his famous Sprechgesang at the winter solstice party. The elementary school guys guffawed. They totally loved it. Some of the high school folk looked at him like, what an idiot, no way this guy will live to be twenty. But Ziggy isn't interested in those high schoolers anyway. They're established. Little wankers, as Ziggy affectionately calls them. They alone still have hope. Ziggy is also drunk, and he's definitely ready to look for some trouble. But there's no one at the Falu stop at this hour of the day so an inanimate object will have to do. Watch him challenge the public transport timetable, but the timetable is a pushover. Frustrated by its lack of aggressiveness, the boy tries to pry it off its post, but the metal sheet just bends from his effort. And since Ziggy is the craziest freak in Elysium, the one who steals public transport timetables so others won't know if the last tram has already gone by or not, he crumples up the sheet with the necessary information and throws it away. The stop is still empty, and Ziggy is still in the mood to rumble, so the trash bin's Weltenschauung is no longer acceptable to him. What did you say? Ziggy pushes the repulsive trash bin with both hands, but it's too full and pleased with itself to stand up for its honor. I heard what you said just now. Raving lunatic. So full of yourself. He dares to raise a hand against private property. You think you're a super cool dude, right? Lunatic dares to raise a hand. What's wrong with arguing? We're all educated people. But you know what? The trash bin has no clue what Ziggy is talking about. It has a snow hat on its head, studded with extinguished cigarette butts. That's all. Wouldn't it still be possible to reach a peaceful settlement? You would like that, wouldn't you? Huh? You'd like that, yeah? 
Kiss my ass, bourgeois. Ziggy kicks a dent into the trash bin and almost loses his balance. With the waste container completely humiliated, this stumbling force of nature turns his attention to the tram stop sign. It flutters in the wind, with Falu written on it. The sign starts spinning like a water wheel when Ziggy jump kicks it, but when he lands, he slips and slams down onto his back. A cloud of snow rises into the air, and for a moment, Ziggy lies there, powder snow falling on his face, and laughs. The street lights shine above him in this dark blue winter night sky, and snowflakes drift by. Somewhere way up there, in the invisible blackness, forgotten communication satellites from a bygone era glide along their orbits. Everything goes around so sweetly, a beautiful, dark, dizzy world under attack. But Ziggy hasn't partied enough yet. He pulls himself up. Since he dismantled the timetable, he now has no idea whether the last tram has already gone by or not. Fortunately, the young man is still in the mood to change the world, and so we see him proceeding on foot, the knees of his jeans white with snow, his leather jacket open in the front, and his pop-idle hair blowing in the wind. He goes along the streets of the suburb, heading towards home. And on both sides of the road, behind the picket fences, wooden houses are sleeping. He casts disdainful glances at them. Coziness is bourgeois. He's looking for the right one, the sweetest one of them all. He has a brick in his hand. He has a pimple on his forehead. Karl Lund, the young paper industrialist, reads a newspaper in the living room downstairs. In the header of the newspaper, there's a silhouette of a centaur with a top hat and grand serif typeface lettering that reads, Capitalist. This isn't the journal of a self-proclaimed speculator, it's a newspaper that was started 500 years ago in the dawn of the market economy, one of the oldest in the world. No get-rich-quick tricks are published here. In Capitalist, all political reality is considered through an economic lens. It's seen the way it actually is. On the flip side of the wishful dreams from the beginning of the century, Karl Lund is concerned about the world. So he reads in order to understand, and he understands in order to help. Genuinely, you could read it yourself with pleasure, and you would be a more influential person for it. But unfortunately, you don't understand capitalist. Ziggy doesn't either. He's tried, but he still doesn't. He didn't try very hard. Crop failure in Yesut, the Zarath epidemic in Saramiriza, these things don't concern Ziggy. He doesn't feel moved by them. To him, these are just reproaches, negativity. Ziggy isn't worried about the world. He doesn't want to understand or to help. He wants something completely different. And in just a moment, he's going to show you what it is. The boy tightens the laces of his sneakers, he doesn't feel cold thanks to his intoxication. He stands at the gate of a white wooden house with a brick in his hand and winds up. The brick flies from his throwing hand. Ziggy has a beastly grin on his face. The lump of stone catapults further into the darkness of the winter night, and at the receiving end, waiting to be destroyed, is a caricature of life which is what a person living a slightly more normal life is to the young Sigismund Berg. Leather-bound books, the smell of mahogany. The window shatters into a thousand little pieces, and the paper industrialist jumps up from his armchair. Upstairs, like a bad omen, dark green eyes fly open. I can't wait any longer, yells Ziggy his elbows at his sides, and his back arched from the strain. End, world, end! Saliva and puffs of steam fly from his mouth. It's a breath of flame reeking of vodka, 
He's a dragon. Carl Lund is still a young man in 51, in his mid-thirties. He flies to the front door like a bullet from a gun and puts on his sports shoes there. For the past month, he's been finding garbage bags with the word bourgeois in his garden. Every morning, the place is littered with rubbish, filthy cans hanging from the quince bushes. He storms out, throws open the garden gates, and stops for a moment. Barely 50 meters away, in the middle of the street, a figure in a black leather jacket is running for his life. The paper industrialist takes off from where he's standing and rushes after the boy. Ziggy's black pop star hair flutters in the wind, wavy and a little greasy too. The icy halos of lanterns behind him contract and unravel into auras as Ziggy whizzes past. Snow flies from under his sneakers. His open jacket flutters in the wind. Fueled by alcohol, Ziggy runs through the best days of his life. But his sneakers keep slipping on the snow, and he's been smoking since he was nine. On top of that, physical education isn't his favorite subject at school. Carl Lund often goes running with his colleagues, and, of course, he doesn't smoke. No, not even cigars. Although, according to Ziggy, holding a garbage bag at, with the word bourgeois, he had seen him, just the day before yesterday, sticking a large, penis-shaped cigar in his mouth. Somewhere in there, behind the windows of a tasteful wooden house. By the way, Karl Lund doesn't drink brandy from a carafe either, and he isn't a part of Les Morts, nor does he engage in sex tourism in developing countries. The man is sprinting in his high-necked black jumper, the white leather of his sports shoes glinting on the snow. The distance shrinks. Ziggy slips on a corner and takes a new start on his hands. Thirty meters away, he hears Carl Lund shouting behind him, Stay put, fucker! His palms sting, his lungs are bleeding, but the superhuman pain tolerance offered by alcohol speaks for Ziggy again. In fact, he's already pulled his leg muscles to shreds after years of slouching around. Sudden sprints come as a big surprise to them. But Ziggy doesn't feel anything. He could run forever. This is, of course, make-believe. The reality is that his body has its limits, and after an eight-minute chase, they make themselves known. At a railway crossing, the two men are running barely ten meters apart. Ziggy makes a sharp turn and flies up the stairs to the platform. In the silence of the suburbs, the patter of their feet on the concrete and their increasingly rough breathing can be heard from some distance. Two dark figures move across the platform under the beams of the lanterns, and the distance shrinks again. One look behind him, and Ziggy sees the bourgeois gentleman approaching with brisk, controlled movements, like a robot sent from the future. The boy jumps off the end of the platform, aiming for the railway industrial recesses of the suburb, there where he hangs around. He keeps his balance as he lands and slumps forward across the snow. In the darkness of the railway embankment, he thinks, he can finally shake the robot off. Why won't he give up already? Usually people like him don't even dare to leave the house. They call their beloved police and then hang out together inside. Ziggy comes first down the snowy strip between the picket fence wall and the railway embankment. The magic of booze is starting to wear off, and he leaves scrapes on the ground as he returns. Like wounded prey. He feels his right leg cramping. So be it. But before that, he still needs it for one last effort. Don't give in now, leg fuck. I'd really like to have a smoke right about now. Behind him, Carl Lund can feel the boy's trail of sweat in his nostrils. He comes from a future where the world didn't end after all. All the people there are bourgeois, and the working class has almost been annihilated. One quick glance at the surroundings, and Carl Lund sees a dead end of garages waiting ahead. He squeezes out the last of his energy, bracing for a crash, intent on ramming into Ziggy at full force and pinning him against the wall. Just one look at that spindly spider, and he knew he could overpower him. 
the man reaches out and touches the tail of his jacket. At this exact moment, there's only a meter or so of ground left before the garage wall. Ziggy pushes himself directly against the brick with his right leg, but the other cramping leg doesn't really connect with the wall with the grace he'd had in mind. His plan partially works. He doesn't run up against the wall with poise like a Serais and Sephiron. He slips, but he manages to grab the edge of the roof with both hands. Ziggy starts to clamber up the wall, but Carl Loon grabs his leg. Damn it, kid, give up! But above him, on the roof of the garage, Ziggy's friend towers over him, cheering him on. Ziggy's friend is grand and majestic, though crippled by time. He flutters like a gray flag in the dark and calls out. A completely destroyed human being rolls himself a smoke in the taiga of northeastern Samara in the Nad Umai ecoregion, which only recently sank into the pale. Twenty kilometers to the south, the world begins with the People's Republic of Samara. Four thousand kilometers further, to the northeast is the Katla Isola, and what lies between the two, no one knows. Don't be naive. Of course it's not some kind of afterlife, Zygismund says, ending the pointless argument. He pulls shreds of tobacco from an aluminum cucumber can and places them on a rolling paper. Before leaving Supermat Ulan, he had stocked up on two months' worth of smoking supplies. The rations should suffice. In the central market, only dried-up leftovers in jars were offered in exchange for buckwheat coupons. The paper doesn't work, either. The adhesive strip doesn't really stick. The paper sticks to his lip, and smoldering tobacco falls from the tip of the cigarette onto his chest. The anthroponaut pats his jacket with his hand, the glowing locusts of sparks the only color in the gray around him. He is sitting in the triangular entrance of his tent, legs out, with a fire sputtering and a hole in the snow in front of him. On the other side of the fire crouches the ghostly gray cytoplasm of Ignis Nielsen, Krasmazov's schoolteacher friend and apocalyptic shrike. This gut-wrenching defect in the film tape is framed by Koshot spruce trees in fog in the background. He is black and white and completely unnatural. Happy birthday! says the ghostly gray cytoplasm. Thirty-nine, answers Ziggy Smuntberg. Well then, how did this happen? You can go ahead and round up to forty. It doesn't matter anymore. Get ready. Tell yourself that you're forty years old. I'm forty years old. Forty years old? What happened? Wasn't there talk about you not getting older than twenty? You didn't have any plans for this time anyway. Why are you crawling around here? You know, Ignis... I'd like to evaporate, the man mumbles and adjusts the fire with a stick. A dark orange tongue of flame comes to life in its heart. Again? Haven't you evaporated enough already? There's always more, Ignis. You can leave less behind. Paper trails, dentists. Ziggy puts a saucepan on the fire, fresh snow melting inside it. They'll catch you with this tooth business. You should have... Back then in Grodd, you should have pulled those suckers yourself with a screwdriver. I tried, but it was too painful. I don't understand what you're saying, man. Don't mumble. And besides, if it's not a doctor, you're overestimating the bourgeois justice system. Discretion contracts, like honor, they only have poka zuha. Do you remember, Mazov? Ziggy pulls dentures out of his anorak coat and puts them in his mouth. You're the one always mumbling nonsense. What about Mazov? And besides, look where I am. Who will come find me anymore? Even the Institute of Entrepreneurics can't find me here. You think? Ziggy puts on an oven mitt and waits for the water to boil. I think so, yeah. And moreover, this time, I don't just want to flee the country. Well, where do you want to flee from then, Ziggy? countries are enormous. From the world. The pale is tinted blue. Snowfields lay beneath it. 
The water bubbles in the saucepan. God forbid, sighs Ignis Dilson, who has been amputated into a stump by the censor of time. The mountain ridge leaves his backwards voice hollow, echoless. My God, I've had more than enough of this disappearance nonsense. After quite a struggle, Ziggy gets his leg free of Carl Lund's grip. He steps on the family man's shoulder and kicks himself up onto the roof of the garage. There he stands, triumphant under the winter sky, so young and so free. The bourgeois crouches in front of him in defeat. Huh? What are you going to do now? Ziggy sputters and gesticulates awkwardly with his hands as if he's putting down the industrialist. What you going to do, huh? Are you going to try to climb up? I'll slam your fingers into a pulp. He stomps on the edge of the garage to demonstrate what will happen if you climb up towards him. You will lose. I win. You just fucking lost. Well done, Ignis Nielsen whispers from the shadows. I, too, nobly stuck it to the middle class. Together with Mazov, we killed them, you understand. Hundreds of thousands of them. We killed almost a million bourgeois. We would have killed more, but we ran out of time. I'll kill you, screams Ziggy. On the attic floor, the apocalyptic blacksmith's feelis has overcome him again, and nothing is forbidden. You hold the world together. I will kill you. I will kill your family. Boy, go to the doctor. Carl Lund waves him off and turns to go, but Ziggy is rolling a snowball in his hands. When it splats against the back of the man's head, he turns around furiously and charges. You little fuck! I'll remember your face! I'll remember your face! Ziggy pokes his face mockingly. I'll remember your face too! I know where you live! Snow floats around Ziggy. Snowflakes melt in his black hair. Get down here, you waste of space! Get down here if you're such a tough man! Ah, I'm coming! Ziggy throws a snowball down at him, but he dodges. I'm coming down with the angels of death, and they're wearing leather coats. Your family is dead, pederast. Very stylish, praises Ignis Nielsen from the shadows. Referencing the special committee members was genius. You are a poet, but a poet of actions, not words. I'll rape your wife. You're on fire, boy, you're on fire. Keep going. You're going to be brought to Yeko Qatar. I'll nationalize your companies. Now it's getting too theoretical. Don't go there. It's a slippery slope. You know you don't really know anything about that stuff. Tell him he's a poofta. Poofta? Enraged, Carl Lund tries to climb up, but Ziggy kicks some snow in his face and starts jumping on his fingers, and the man falls back down. Okay, now is a good time to scram. But first, say something fierce to him. Poofta? That'll do, says Ignis Nielsen, and Ziggy's leather-jacketed figure disappears into the darkness of the garages. A silhouette emerges from the blue-gray haze, next to the big tires of a dump truck that's blanketed in snow. It is still twilight and gray in Nod Umai. Ziggy Smuntberg comes alone down the road on the mountainside, carrying an enormous rucksack and with an aging rocker's ponytail hidden deep under the furry-edged hood of his anorak coat. Smoke leaks from the hood like a chimney. A man, two ski poles in his hands and a cigarette in his mouth, trudges through the entrepenetic catastrophe. When Mazov could no longer wait for the world revolution. You mean when he shot himself in the head because he turned into a monster? Or was it because he was about to lose? It's not like that at all. To his left, Ignis Nielsen flutters like the gray flag. Mazov had a gentle soul. There was a reaction everywhere. No matter how many we killed, there were always more of them. And then there were the setbacks. Everything completely collapsed in Revachol. He was just sad. He didn't think he was a monster. Zygismund's lonely Kirza boot tracks run along the road between the spruce trees. Holes in the snow from ski poles run next to them. Tell me, the power ending up in your hands, how much did it cost? How many comrades did it cost? 
Tell me how it really was this time. I knew that Mazov's idea was working again when the other communists came to kill me. Was it like that? Or wasn't it? Of course not. You want to assume the worst of us, Sigismund, so that you don't have to believe in anything anymore. So that you can do what you came here to do. So tell me, when can the two of us expect a round of cleaning? When will you go on alone? Honestly, I thought about it, Ignis. Go ahead and think, but know that it wasn't all murder and killing. And when I took over, when I finally had it all in my hands, it was an intoxicating feeling. Can you imagine the whole country being yours? It was made of nothing but goodness, that feeling. I held Gra gently, like an architect holds districts of panel houses. Rows of gray boxes crackle in Ignis's chest, like a window into history. Like matchboxes in the palm of your hand. And I promised that now that I had been given the opportunity, I would do what's best for the people. And you know, I didn't disappoint myself. But it all slipped away, and only one extra isolary colony remained. Some kind of mountain goat shit. Don't be so petty. Be skeptical, but don't underestimate Samara. My heart is buried in Samara. When we retreated there... That's right, retreated. Why did you retreat again? Why do my guys always retreat? It was inevitable. I wasn't going to throw off my gloves and become a fatalist. I gave everything for this colony. My Samaran Revolutionary Republic. That's right. The People's Republic is senile. I will never forgive them for doing this. After me, they messed it up. The senility. I will never forgive this. The ghostly gray cytoplasm feels defeated. The entrepreneur goes over a mountain bridge with its barriers open. Empty guard booths are buried in the snow on both sides of the road. At the end of the bridge, a sign reads, Nemeng's Ool, 36 kilometers. And then onward, through the snowy gray taiga of the Umai Mountains. Only two weeks ago, the world's largest reserves of fluoride, tungsten, zinc, and extremely rare samarskite were dug up from the Earth's crust here. Workshops chattered. Industrial waste painted the ecoregion's crisp silver wart into rusty foam. But not anymore. Now there is silence and peace here. The entrepreneur goes down the dump truck road into the dark crevice of the valley, the spruce forest darkening around him. In front of him, on the snowy road, runs a flurry of hoofprints. It was spectacular. It was a loss of self, a complete dedication for the good of the people. I was a ruling machine on amphetamines. I never slept. None of us slept. We built it all from nothing, with the help of the Yikuts. It was a brotherhood of nations. They respected our weapons, and we respected their cheerful minds and dancing. In six years, a country rose from nothing. The workers worked themselves to death, toiling for the fifth day in a row. They literally died on the construction site, of a heart attack, of fatigue. Of a gun butt in the back of the head? You think so, but you're wrong. It would be like that now, of course, but it wasn't like that then. You can't imagine what happened there, how it was. It ran throughout the world like happiness intoxication. Happiness intoxication? Amphetamine was common in your country then, and not yet medically tested. But Ignis doesn't listen. I said terrible things, yes. I stood on a white horse in a blizzard and gave speeches. In the mountains, on the construction site, I swung my sword with silver sunbeams on the hilt. And all around me fluttered white flags, crests of crowned horns made with silver thread, a pentagon between the prongs of the horns, the branches raised to heaven. Everyone who came here with me became happy, Ziggy. Communism is powerful. Believe in communism. It's a burst of enthusiasm. I promise. It's beautiful when you believe in a person. 
but without it. Without it, there is nothing. Nothing. It was a blizzard, but it was bright. It was morning. Communism is white. It sparkles. Communism is the morning. It is a jubilation. The pale begins to recede dangerously around the entrepreneur. The world turns white. Beams of light seeps from Ignis's chest into the dim spruce trees. The falling snow sparkles in the beams like silver confetti, the color creeping into the world like a threat. Ziggyspunt stomps his foot. He covers his ears with his hands and shouts, Enough! Stop! Enough! Stop! Rolls across the field like a sword cutting through the air. Please forgive me, Ziggyspunt, my friend, says the voice of the distortion. The man is panting in the middle of the forest road. It is dim and twilight again. The pale returns, and the entrepreneur breathes a sigh of relief. Do you want me to... want me to lose my mind? No, I just wanted you to understand how good everything was then. What kind of time it was. What a beautiful time. I'm sorry. That time has passed. It's buried in your punch cards and shit. No one can tell what was there anymore. No one knows what it was really like. It shifted from its place. What was really there is gone, and only the pale remains. It's an imprint. You do realize that. I realize that. It's those girls of yours who talk like that, the cytoplasm whispers softly in Ziggyspun's ear. The spruce trees are swaying. It's dim in the pale, but seductively soft. Those girls of yours. Girls don't believe in anything. All girls are bourgeois, Ziggy. They weren't bourgeois. They were bourgeois, every last one of them. They read their girls' magazines. Revachal bourgeois fashion and perfumes. Virginity lost stories. It's all bourgeois. Every girl is actually a weapon of the bourgeoisie. You didn't know them. You don't know what they were thinking about. No one knows what they were thinking. I don't know either, but it wasn't bourgeois, Ignis. It was something else. If that's what you want to think, then be my guest. But you'd better believe in people, not in them. Believe in communism. I already tried, but I can't. It doesn't work for me. I'm not the communist type. Then why are you talking to me? After all, I am communism itself, the specter that walks the earth. Why have you been with me all these years if you don't believe in communism? Because of anger towards those who've had it better in life, Ignis. And besides, you're a monster, a grotesque. Who doesn't love the company of monsters? I'm not a monster. You are a monster. They call you the Apocalyptic Shrike. Who else do you know who's called that? No one is called that. All of that Grodd massacre was by your hand. Your signature is everywhere. And during the retreat, when Mazov had stopped giving orders, you had the enemy soldiers impaled on trees. Twelve thousand of them. You had spruce trees sharpened into spears. You made a forest of spears. It was obscene, Ignis. It was so that they would let me build my nation. My nation of the future. You do understand. They never would have left us alone. They would have shot us like wild game. That may be the case. But still, excess. Shrike. Look what's become of you. Human speech sounds out of place in the silence of the pale. It echoes in the gloom of the trees as Zygismund trudges through the snow. There's an old trick coined by the great entrepreneur K. Voronikin that you have to shout in the pale. Otherwise, you start to feel gloomy and the past comes up. But Zygismund needn't be afraid of that. When he first entered the pale, he discovered to his great dismay that he couldn't return like everyone else. Or rather, he could but not where he really wants. 
This makes him indispensable to Mazov's idea. The disappearance of the Lun children has literally given Ziggy special entrepreneurial powers. The morning has passed. It's getting dark. A few tens of kilometers further on, the far pale begins, and the world's times of day no longer register there at all. He has to save up his batteries for that. He considers it, but then turns his flashlight on anyway. The snow shimmers in the beam of the light, and Zygismund directs it to his wretched friend. The ignis defect shines through. Look at yourself. You're pathetic. It would be better for everyone if they'd done a clean job. A bunch of amateurs. I would have set all the film tapes of you on fire. It's so cruel somehow that you're lingering here. But then you never would have known me, Ziggy. Think of all the times we've shared. After all, not everything has been bad. What about me? I'm talking about you. Wouldn't a history without you in it be better? There would be no forest of spears and amphetamine, no stump of cytoplasm. Who needed this at all? It doesn't mean anything anymore, anyway. Ignis tries to buy time. You know that. It doesn't matter how many we killed. The world is ending. Soon, no one will remember me, not to mention you, if even the mighty of this world are not remembered. It's better that way. That is the way it should be. And the mighty of this world? You're an ugly monstrosity who ran amuck in this world. You rampage too. Look at your hand, Ziggy. Let's not forget. One more word. Say it and you're gone. The entrepreneur snaps. Compared to you, I haven't done anything. And besides, which of us is the commissar of the revolution? Is that you? No, it's not. Ignis shivers, frightened. I'm sorry, friend. Ten thousand apologies. You alone are the commissar of the revolution. Ziggy Smuntberg, the top of the party in your mind. I have no authority. All I have is this humble critique I've written about myself. Take it, but don't kill me. There is nothing on the other side of me. I'll do anything to stay, anything at all. I am hope. You know what I want. This is the last thing. Start talking. But Ignis is unable to speak. He has no mouth. The defect of the film strip frolics in the dark, in the beam of the flashlight. This is the height of cruelty. The impossible is required. An uncomfortable silence spreads in the forest air around him. Everyone is embarrassed. Why, Ignis? The entrepreneur repeats and leans closer peering into the heart of history with a flashlight. Why did you do that? There was no point. I understand why you emptied banks. It was necessary. You even took a symphony orchestra with you in the retreat, by force. People like music. But why that? Who was happy about that? Why Harnan Kaur? That model didn't serve any purpose. Tell me that, and you can stay. But I don't have a clue. The inside-out voice sounds sad. The soundtrack slows down. I don't know anything that you don't. No more chats. The entrepreneur shakes himself. Snow falls from the shoulders of the anorak coat. He goes on alone. An hour of frozen machine tracks and hoofprints in the snow run along in the flashlight beam. And when a herd of ebex finally emerges from the darkness, they are frozen in place in the middle of the road, like an exhibit in a natural history museum. Some of the females sometimes jerk in place, sneezing. This is a nervous impulse, a muscle tremor. The backs of the stuffed animals are already covered with snow, but their snouts are still steaming. They're still breathing, some for a few days, some for a week. The anorak-clad figure moves through the herd with the indifference of a professional, till the beam of his flashlight casts the alpha male's crown of horns as a shadow on the wall of spruce trees. Zygismund looks into the animal's glazed eyes. Its sense of time has broken down. An automaton's primitive fragment of a brain strays in the pale faster than that of a human. 
This is how hunters from the outskirts go hunting in the Entrokata. Of course, they'll eventually go mad from it as well, and one day they won't return. But not Ziggy. He has special abilities. He takes a pocket knife from his belt and slits the protein mass's throat. Chapter 17 Harnankur 150 years ago, on another isola, the Grand Isola, it snows in the city of Mirova. It's a midwinter evening, but thousands of people have gathered in the harbor. The key bustles with them. In the background lies Imperial Grad, church steeples, and chimneys. The crowd is waving, bidding farewell to the airship rising into the sky. A swan made of wood and nickel rises into the blizzard, and the passengers of the world's first interisolary flight wave to the crowd from its balcony baskets, well-dressed bougie people with a never-before-seen adventure ahead of them. It's the pale, terrifying, but at the same time such an upbeat and unforgettable experience. Modern technology, in the form of a luxuriously upholstered airship, now makes such an experience possible for an ordinary, if perhaps slightly better off, citizen. And on the other side of the pale, oh, mystical pale, the land of Katla awaits, with its royal capital of Vasa. This juncture in history is monumental. Journalists are swarming. Photo flashes are lighting up. The small bulbs in the cameras burn out. Their light causes snowflakes to freeze in the air. That's the exposure time in which Nadia Harnankur is captured. The operetta star poses for the photo arm in arm with the chief engineer, wearing a fur hat with her long, beautiful neck craned out. She smiles and waves her handkerchief at her namesake in the sky. The letters Harnankur in the old Gradian alphabet adorn the departing airship. This is the peak of Nadia's fame. Two days later, the interisolary flight enters the pale, and then, barely six hours later, deviation occurs in the airship's course. Harnon Kor has gone missing with 1,500 passengers on board. The flight is believed to have drifted into an uncharted entrepreneurial mass, the pale superdeep. But who all thinks that? Para-historians evaporation nerds and a couple of crazy SRV pale fanatics, men like K. Voroknikin, a demented entrepreneur and communist from the People's Republic of Samara, and an internationally unrecognized authority on the field of history, Inayat Khan, who I guess doesn't live in his mother's basement anymore. Regardless, other parts of historical science, which men of the Khan and Voroknikin type contemptuously call the mainstream, do not recognize the existence of an airship called Harnankur. The first civilian interisolary flight was called Anastasia Lux, and that happened one decade later. Seventy-five years later, when the revolutions of the turn of the century had subsided, Harnankur was more or less forgotten. The documentation that the newspaper archives provided could have been destroyed, for example, in the fires of the Grand Revolution. But still, the event would be too large-scale for that. If historical memory proves itself backhandedly, even in the case of a small cog like Julius Kuznitsky, the disappearing commissar, then where did the world's first interisolary flight, with 1,500 people on board, disappear to? In the century after the revolution, Harnankur finally sank into the shadows of history. Until the 50s, that is, when interest in disappearance cases suddenly took on the dimensions of a subculture in the middle class of developed countries. Certainly not an inexplicable phenomenon. These men, mostly young and unpopular with the opposite sex, were dubbed desoperatists after the best-selling book of their genre, Los Desparacidos. They became interested in one photo, one Nadia Harnoncour, a marginally interesting disappearance case, standing in the harbor. She is waving, fur hat on her head, arm in arm with the chief engineer. 
There are unearthly crowds in the background, and they are all waving at something in the sky. But there in the sky is a mysterious void. This void is the holy grail of disappearance nerds. According to the disoperatists, the best fit is the most convincing bit of evidence. An industrial presentation model of the airship of the same name, which the communists took with them to the then Revolutionary Republic, now People's Republic, when they retreated from Grad to Samara. The original is on display at Supermont Ulan's Museum of Entrepreneurs and is taken very seriously by the communists. It's just a pity that no one takes the communists seriously. The SRV entrepreneur K. Saranovich Voronikin argues in his memoirs that the ship had to exist because the model is technically feasible from an engineering standpoint. In other words, it could carry more than a thousand people through the pale on a commercial trip with all the amenities. The production of such an industrial project would have been a brilliant scientific achievement of its time. Why not turn all this work into a commercially attractive business? It would not be diamaterialist at all. Critics say that more than 200 fieldwork campaigns into the pale have left their mark. According to Voronikin, the project that was being carried out, again according to him, was lost forever on the first trip. Would the model still work? Could Harnoncourt be some sort of failed prototype of Anastasia Lux? Why is there no documentation at all? K. Voronikin, however, claims that the model was made into a ship. The ship deviated from its course, and it encountered an as-of-yet unknown phenomenon in the pale. Chapter 18 Three Meat Piroshkis 148 years later, Mirova, the capital of Grad, glows behind the walls of high-rise windows. During the fevered nights of history, all of its imperial architecture was blown up. Then the rioters were driven out, and now the city is a spirit resurrected by democracy into a ghost glowing with lights. It is a terrible, out-of-control living environment, in constant motion in the glass reflections of its skyscrapers. Like some mythological horror, Mirova can only be looked at in a mirror. Its movement is Grad's unstoppable economic growth made physical, an assertion of true thermodynamic impossibility. Subways slide by, pearly rivers of traffic swirl day and night. The nerve center, Nu, can be seen from here, from the 60th floor. Nu is the height of arrogance of one nation, the nation of Grad, a financial peninsula. The scientists here claim, once the earth was covered with a geosphere, then with the biosphere, now is the time of the Nu sphere. A mind covers the earth, and news skyscrapers are the throne of that network. The throne of the mind. Here it does its arithmetic in long-distance calls, in invisible transmissions. Its thoughts are intangible financial instruments. No one knows what they are or how much they cost. The mirrored glasses are black. Obviously the interisolary real. But what is a person? A person is light. The scientific community of the People's Republic, the third generation of expelled rioters, laughs at this. In Samara, they have also introduced a fourth term. The entroposphere, the wave equations, Samara's calculations, are promising. At any moment, this beautiful thing will sweep Grad off the face of the earth in that barely perceived place where communism becomes nihilism, definitely a more subtle transition than from a friend of children to a molester of children. The cream of the crop of the political party seemed to think, why not? Our idea is no longer to win the hearts, and let's be honest, we never will. We love the idea, but the world somehow doesn't. Let it disappear, then if that's how it's going to be. When Saryan Ambartsumyan turns his back on the window of his new penthouse, only two years remain until that day. There will be a class reunion, 
then the northern pass will collapse. And in the chain of events that's triggered, it will become clear that what's shining behind Ambartsamyan is nothing less than the last stage of development of Stihia. All light comes from outside. Snow floats by outside of the window, evaporating from the howl of news thoughts long before it reaches street level, sixty stories below. There will never again be winter in Mirova. Only here under the sky does it still exist. It's cold in the hall. The pillars stand out in the darkness. The phone rings. Ambartsamyan walks over barefoot, wearing a suit. The shadows of snowflakes dance on the glass display cases around him, which contain the world's largest private collection of disappearance memorabilia. Sometime in the past, before Ambartsamyan became a fifty-year-old oil billionaire, he had been a young man without much success with the opposite sex. One of the first. Only the ringing of the telephone breaks the dignified silence at the hall. The man takes a seat at his desk and clicks the speaker on. He places his free hand on the skull of Ramut Karzai, where it sits on the desk. It is authentic. I'm listening. Some man from Katla, Vasa area code, reports the faithful secretary. He says that the number was given at a private collection auction, but I think he probably wants a loan. Why? Well, this long-distance call is at the expense of the respondent. Embartsimyan roars with laughter. At the respondent's expense. All right, connect. But alone. The man waits, one hand on Ramut Karzai's skull, the other on his gray beard. He is of massive stature. You don't give loans, says the secretary. Exactly. Out of principle. I don't. Connect. The speaker switches to a long-distance call. The pail seeps into the hall air from the fabric-covered ziggurat. The signal runs as an entrepreneurial sequence through the great unknown, from Katla to Grad. Relay stations clear the call from the noise of history along the way, but something always creeps into the wires, a ghost radio station. Its quiet voice in its unintelligible language reminds us what it's here for, to end life. Azimuth Boreas Sinus passes through the broadcast in a hidden radio frequency and disappears. Embartsamyan is used to it. Through the noise and 3,000 kilometers of pale, a distorted human voice is heard. It says, Hello, greetings. My name is Inayat Khan. Who? Inayat Khan. Okay, Yat Khan, where did you get my number? Inayat Khan. I got it from the Nor Kerping Fair, the auction. They said to call about your hobby. Are you still Mr. The man rummages around for something. Mr. Ambartsumyan? Yes, that's me. And you collect things from people who have disappeared? Disappeared. The pale whispers on the loudspeaker. Yes, I collect them, replies Ambartsumyan. And no, it is not my hobby. I put my heart into what I do. I take it seriously. I do too. You can be sure of that. Can I? Things from people who have disappeared. What are you talking about? The correct term is still Disappearance memorabilia. Embartsamyan sinks contentedly into his armchair in the dimness of the hall. Well said. The armchair is made of expensive leather. Listen, I know what the correct term is, all right? Khan is starting to get pissed off. Meetings between disoperatists are rarely cordial. They tend to quarrel. It's not like I'm calling about my very first purchase ever. And no, I'm not buying it as a paperweight either, if that's what you're afraid of. So you have a professional collection. You wouldn't ask me that if you gave me a chance to tell you what I just bought. How extensive is your collection? You see? You're not letting me tell you. 
Well, I will eventually. I'd still like to know first who I'm talking to. And Bart Young doesn't raise his voice. After years of training, it contains only a barely perceptible bit of the whiny voice cracking of a nerd. His zits are also rather more psychological. His gray beard is authoritative. He strokes from Utkar's eye's skull like a pet. Anyway, I consider the technical model of Harnan Kor to be my crown jewel, exclaims Khan, a whimpering note in his voice. Who are you talking to over there? A woman's voice in the background spoils the drama of the moment. Come eat. The food is getting cold. Khan muffles the receiver with his hand, but the hall still echoes with, Mom, let me talk. Stop interrupting. Mother. The pale hisses back. This is my mother. Ambartsum Young shakes his head. He leans closer to the table. And you have Harnankur? Yes, I have it, says Khan. A copy? No, I went thieving in Supermont Ulan. Of course I don't have the original. And you don't have it either. Khan gathers himself for a moment. I understand that you have another copy in your possession, yes? That's why I'm calling. It's written in the contract, the responsibility of the owner. I have to get a service manual from you. Do you have any idea what this is? And Bartsumyan is dead serious. Do you know how important this is? There's nothing left after this. And Bartsumyan nods slowly. Right. You have to devote time to her. To hold her. You have to think of her like how you think of a girl. Understand? Like a beautiful girl. Have you ever seen one? You have to be responsible. It's not a toy. To think of her? In what sense? That's the maintenance manual. You didn't think I was going to tell you about the switch. For example, did you know that there was also a third copy? A third copy? Khan doesn't understand. Of course you didn't know. And Bartsumyan gravely folds his hands on his chest. Now you know, there was also a third copy. But all that remained was an empty display case. You have to watch her all the time. Don't let her out of your sight. Don't leave her alone. And when you do, think of her. Do you think it's a coincidence that they keep the original in a museum? Think, hundreds of people pass by every day. They look at her, and then, when the museum is closed, the night watchmen are watching. Khan says nothing. A ghost-like hum echoes through the ether. This is an impossible object, concludes Ambartsumyan. The world no longer supports her. The pale freezes at the bottom of the valley two years later. There is no longer a single soul on the forest crossing. A ribbon of blood drops trails across the snow, along the dark tunnel of the road, in competition with bootprints. Past the giant spruce trees, weighed down by snow, until the intersection with the main road. There, at the intersection, there's a red puddle on the ground, and next to it, an abandoned campfire. There is a homemade frame on the fire. Two branches hold the third one over the extinguished fire pit. Bones gnawed clean lay in the snow. And forward, along the highway where cars no longer drive, frozen electric wires meander in the dark. Drop by drop across the blanket of snow, with the boot prints, with terrible determination. The wrecks of crawler machines sleep in a ditch by the road. The dark shapes of a fuel oil station looms behind the bend. Oreole, laudanum, ultra, tricolor, ellipse. Something is rising. There is a screeching sound of steel. 
tell me that you understand what I'm talking about and that you will start doing it. And Bart Sim Young orders. I think so. I'll try. Don't just try. Do it. You'll understand eventually. After the third one disappeared, I became paranoid to say the least. To this day, when I walk into the room and turn on the lights, I fear it will happen again. That there will be an empty display case in the middle of the room. That there will be nothing in this room at all. You will soon have the same outlook. Then you'll understand what I'm talking about. In what sense are you afraid that it will happen again? The wording does not go unnoticed by Khan. And Bart Sumyan is silent. He taps the skull on the table. What do you mean by again? Repeats Khan. I lost her. That's what happened. She was mine, too, the third one. But you know, it wasn't like it usually is when something disappears. Keys, for example, or something expensive. Have you felt it? Been faced with such a phenomenon? With such a feeling? The professional arrogance in Khan's voice is wiped away in an instant. I have, he says. Then you know what I'm talking about. Someone knows what I'm talking about. The man's hand slips from Ramut Karzai's skull. The floodlights of a distant airship slide by outside the window of the hall, and the shadows of the pillars creep along the floor. When did it start for you? asks Embart Simyan. Eighteen years ago. That was the first time. From there on... Khan falls silent. From there on, it gets more and more frequent, right? Yes, answers Khan. And on top of other things, too. What other things? Embart Simyan has now moved his ear to the speaker, his chest on the table. All things? Yes. Side streets, a girl riding a bicycle, and light. Or when a horse looks on, especially animals. In the whole world? Yes, the whole world. On both sides of the highway, heavy tracked machines, iron relics, rise up into the pale. They spin, helpless bodies, snow falling from their rusty frames. This is how matter degrades, drop by drop, like an analog rhythm running from red through the colorless world. The international alphabet is hidden in the low-frequency waves. Nadir, Ellipse, Gamut, Azimuth. And so on, to the border of the settlement. Nemeng Ul has a ghost district of panel houses. The streets are empty, and there are three-story concrete buildings rising on the hillsides on either side of the valley. A single bicycle hangs in the air next to a swing. Otherwise, everything is completely normal. Convenience store windows and a community center pass by. Footprints run up the stairs to the hospital door, where the padlock has been broken open. He will escape. He escapes. Tricolor, Likon, Oreole, Nadir. Echoes in the dark of the corridor. Connection terminated. And it's been like this for you for 18 years? It's been 12 for me. And Bartomion sinks back into his chair, deep into the leather. Then it gets even worse, but eventually... Khan's voice hisses in the curve of the pail. Eventually, it changes somehow. It's somehow good, this feeling. Good? Yes, as if everything will be all right. As if everything will be all right, sighs Embart Sumyan. I don't have it anymore, and it's better like that. I sold mine, the remaining model, a while ago. This endless watching, the obligation. The man collects himself. It wore on me. You sold it just like that? Just like that, and cheap, too, to the first bidder. 
and the man seemed right. He really wanted it too. That was important. There must be someone who could take care of a thing like that. Someone who looks at her a lot and doesn't let her disappear. Like me. One thousand five hundred people. It was... But the register says it's still in your hands. What register? The auction register. Khan's voice is getting increasingly sharp. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you. I would talk to the new owner. No, I don't understand. The man had to register it himself. Are you certain? And Bartsemian gets up and walks around the table, still holding the skull. Perhaps... Who did you sell it to, if you still remember? Of course I remember, okay? snorts M. Bartsemian. Berg was his name. A private collector. Siggy Smundberg? The speaker blasts. With black hair? Skinny? Something like that, yes. It was... What was it now? Ten years ago? But yes, Ziggy Smundberg. Are you absolutely sure? Was he foul-mouthed? No, actually, tell me, did he speak with an accent? As if he lived in Vasa. God, I don't remember such details. There could have been an accent. Why is this so important? And you said ten years ago. What year exactly? Fifty-nine or sixty. Why? In any case, it was after 57. Absolutely certain. Listen, I have papers here. There you go, commands M. Bartsumyan with the skull towards the speaker. Why is it so important all of a sudden? Because... The voice in the ziggurat could explode with excitement at any moment. That man died in 57. The giant-like oil baron hunches over the table. Please repeat that. What? But on the other end, Khan is no longer listening. A clue! He explodes, and the last thing M. Bartsum Young hears is the man's distant voice in an ever-increasing hiss. Mom! Mom! I found a clue! Two years later. The platform of Mirova's floating train station has emptied for the night. The rest of the passengers have long gone home. The magnet train, stopped by its buffers, rests above the city, next to the platform. The five-story scales of the cars tower above, and next to them, through the blizzard, a robot walks. A voice approaches. The robot walks, and a big fat pilot sitting on it, in the cockpit, turns the robot's head. Deet-deet-deet, answers the control system. The machinery corrects course, the flaps of its herringbone coat blowing in the wind. Hey, seriously, maybe that's enough of that, the thin blonde man next to the robot grumbles. His head is throbbing. Behind him lies a six-day-long train ride of binge drinking, full of incessant gibberish about disappearances. Embartsumyan and Ziggy. Remote Car's eye skull and a vanished airship with characteristics that remind Khan of the girls. But the amateur anthropogenetics got so morbid that no one really wanted to think about it. And then they found themselves on the stage of the bar Panorama, singing karaoke. All three of them. Now I am so happy I found you. The robot speeds up instead. The pilot has pulled the machine's head back, that's why. That means acceleration. The robot goes along and the fat man giggles on its shoulders. A turquoise-orange-violet scarf blowing in the wind. Hydraulics operational. Starting diagnostics, says the robot in a robot's voice and moves along. Weapon systems, check, the pilot orders, snapping his fingers in the direction of the skinny person below. Weapon systems operational, replies the robot. The skinny blonde abruptly hands the pilot a bottle. He puts the fuel in the machine's mouth. It roars, and red liquid drips onto the snow. Fuel reserves 100%. Forward, the fat man points to the blizzard. 
Wait, says the robot, and adjusts its load. Are you ready? Ready. Starting. Search and rescue protocol, says the robot. But it only manages to take three steps. When, far on the other side of the platform, someone steps out of the blizzard. The robot is startled. The fat man falls off its back. The blonde instinctively dodges. The wanted agent, Therese Machiek, pulls a pistolet from his coat pocket, and the man from Internal Affairs on the other side of the platform reciprocates. Behind him, two more agents of the ICP appear out of the storm, pistolets in firing position. They aim, and Machiek, the wanted agent, aims back at them. It's sad to see, says the man from Internal Affairs, how far he has fallen. Just imagine, 22 solved cases, but now a compulsive disappearer. The floating station hangs in the air like a black spirit above Mirova's glow. Therese Machiek, a former agent, stands there on the platform, on a windy street beneath the sky. The man from Internal Affairs can see his unshaven beard, the tie thrown over his shoulder and his drunkard's face. The flavored berry wine freezes on his chin, his tobacco-stained teeth transformed into something like a smile. His two friends, hunched on the snow, are gesturing at him. They are panicking. The man from Internal Affairs wears a proper black coat and a black suit. Did you think that you could just disappear from the ICP? He shouts into the storm. You put the gun down, you come in calmly, and no one gets hurt. There are twenty men down below. There is no escape from here. The maddened agents shout something, but it's inaudible in the rising wind. The bloodhound of internal affairs cups his ear with his hands. What? Frentecek the Brave comes from the other side of the platform, along with a pistol at shot. No! shouts Khan. Ziggy kicks open the door in slow motion. Splinters fly. The spine of the lock gives in with a rattle. The door comes off its hinges and hangs there miserably. The bare-chested boy stands in the doorframe, a bottle of wine in his right hand. He sweats from amphetamines, longs for a pampering and beauty. He is seventeen years old, with three years left on his shelf life. The boy puts his left hand in his pants. Which of you bourgeois whores wants to fuck? A living room with respectable interior design spreads out in front of Ziggy. Twenty young, middle-class people sit there. A house party. Half of them are girls, but none of them want to sleep with Ziggy. It's the evening of the next day, New Year's Eve. Fifty-one will turn to fifty-two in two hours, and these young people are Ziggy's new schoolmates. Right about now is when they start to think that maybe they shouldn't have invited Ziggy. Enough! Handsome Alexander jumps up from the sofa, but he doesn't get these words out in time. Get out, you waste of space! He can't betray his friend, Ziggy, because, to be honest, Ziggy has no friends. Ziggy is a sweaty monster. He shouts, Ziggy, strike first! And then a bottle of red wine flies into handsome Alexander's face. The young man, beautiful as Absalom, covers his face with his hands. My God, my face! He looks at the wine on his hands and thinks it's gushing blood. His face! shouts Alexander's girl, one of many, and jumps behind the couch. He broke Alex's face, the whole room murmurs. Handsome Alexander himself is blinded by grief. His wine-drenched face contorts as an impossibly beautiful battle cry escapes his lips. Ah! He lunges at Ziggy's feet. My face! I'll kill you! A sweaty junkie and a male beauty in a tight shirt are rolling around on the floor. Ziggy tries to get up, but handsome Alexander won't let him. He punches as hard as he can. He's really being rough. There seems to have been a miscalculation. 
Ziggy forgot that handsome Alexander goes to the gym after school and pays equal attention to all of his muscle groups. Ziggy is in pain. The floor lamp topples over, along with someone's cup. Inside Ziggy's skull, the middle-class youth is spinning in the shallow underwater blows of his fists. Ziggy can hear the voices, girls' voices. They say, Junkie! Loser! His hand scrambles around, but he can't get a single weapon in his hands. Ah, if only there were a sword, a beautiful sword, with an inverted pentagon in the hilt, like the sun's rays. Damn it, let's go help Alex, the daring boys approach and send kicks straight to his stomach. Ziggy thrashes, held back by a tough, muscular body. Pray. Always pray, the cytoplasm whispers. The internal affairs agent's coat flutters. There, in its black fabric, is a tiny bullet hole. Useless, silly resistance. Three puffs of gun smoke fly into the blizzard in response. The former collaboration police agent's kneecap explodes on impact. The first shot sweeps Therese off his feet. The second hits his shoulder. A splash of tendons and blood clots in the blizzard. Front. Khan hears his friend mumbling. He raises his head from the snow. Therese's potato-colored hair, splattered with blood, blows in the storm. Hazel eyes, damp from the wind. That's how the Koiko gets up on his knees. His pistolet shakes. Gunpowder spills into the barrel. Ball-bearing ammunition flows from his coat pocket. But Therese can't find it in the snowy pool of blood. His wounded hand can't handle the delicate finger work of loading. Everything gets messed up. Three cloaked figures approach on the platform, cautiously, with their backs hunched like jackals. Therese falls on his back, crawls backwards. He drags a trail of blood through the snow with his wet, ragged clothes. His pistol and gunpowder are left behind in the steaming pool in front of Khan. With their coattails flapping like wings, three co-op agents sweep past Khan. The man from Internal Affairs crouches and winds up, pistol in hand. Khan watches in shock as Therese gets punched in the face by the Angel of Death's pistol grip and jerks back. With all of that, no one will notice Jesper clawing at the puddle. He doesn't know why, but he hides his friend's service weapon in his chest pocket like memorabilia. Ziggy flies through the garden gate. Two boys threw him out by his arms and legs, like a sack of potatoes. The boy lands in a heap on the street of the garden city. The white picket fence glows next to him in the dark. The gate remains ajar as the boys leave. Before the house door is slammed shut, music can be heard from inside, the party has started up again, but then, silence. Snowflakes sparkle. The Kotla winter night is icy clear, and Ziggy, with some effort, rolls himself onto his back under it. His body doesn't obey his commands. He's still laying around bare-chested in the snow. The dear, doomed world is spinning all around him. The wreaths of light from the street lights shine in his black eyes, in the wheels of the horse carriage. The boy begins to laugh, setting the dogs barking. And their barking makes all the dogs in the neighborhood bark. Good prey, whispers the cytoplasm. Communism loves you. Now pull yourself up on your stumps, go back in, and butcher the whole house. Ziggy grabs a handful of cold snow and rubs it on his face. The snow turns into red berry jelly at the base of his nose. He slams a snowball against his swollen eye socket. The barking of dogs in the darkness echoes against his eardrums. At least break a window. Tell them they're bourgeois. They don't understand, yells Ziggy. They don't know what a bourgeois is. Do you understand that it doesn't offend them? They don't know what it means. How can they not know what bourgeois means? 
just like that, Ziggy growls and slaps his hand down on the snow. It's a random historical word, romantic even, like cuirass or coquette. He tries to prop himself up on his elbows, but he can't. He collapses. Snow crunches under the soles of someone's shoes in the garden. They're coming to kill you. Run, pray. Shut up, whispers Ziggy. All the dogs fall silent at once. Somewhere, a delicate coat rustles. The smell of winter wafts into his nose, so sweet that he doesn't dare to breathe anymore. He holds his breath, and in the distance, the snow crunches in the dark. He knows what those footsteps are. Those footsteps destroy. His destruction and Il Maraz. That's the direction in which the original civilization worshipped, 1,500 years ago. And that's where it vanished from history, with all its pillars and ancient string instruments. So no one really knows where those ethnicities came from, all those people. The garden gate creaks open. It sounds like a memory, gone as soon as it's happening. Ziggy doesn't understand what's causing this terrible feeling. It must be the Samaran meth. The boy can't take it anymore, and he exhales. A silver breath rises from his battered mouth. Doom stands over him and breathes. Twenty-one years later, an entrepreneur walks along the empty hospital corridors of Nemeng's Ool. Blood drips onto the linoleum from two freshly flayed goat legs on his back. He carries a fuel oil canister in each hand. He kicks open the door and strides up the fire escape to a large steel door. There he finally stops and sets the canisters down. The fuel oil inside them sets them rigging. The entrepreneur draws pliers from his rucksack like a sword. The iron clicks. The sound of steel echoes down the stairwell of the abandoned emergency room. And further back, through the far pale, through the abandoned ghost districts of panel houses, to the highway, the fueling station, the intersection, it echoes. Along the trail of blood, to the campfire, and to the dark forest, to the Museum of Natural History, where mold grows on the horns of males and puffs of steam no longer rise from the kids' nostrils. They still breathe, not oxygen, but pure pale. The door flies open, and the entrepreneur steps out onto the roof of the hospital. The pale moves in waves there. He walks through it in his anorak jacket, canisters in hand, and goat legs on his back. He drops the containers and kicks them forward. The canisters slide across the snow on the roof, fuel oil sloshing inside them. The entrepreneur runs a hand through his receding hairline and aging rocker ponytail. In front of him, on the landing platform, under the tarpaulin cover, floats an object the size of a small house. His backpack falls into the snow. He grabs the cable holding the cover taut. The oily steel slips between his gloves. He tightens the cable. The object sways in the pail. The carabiner clicks free from its attachment, and Ziggy Splint lets it zip open. The dark canvas rises up into the pail like a bird, and below it a small airship comes into view. The robust iron lump floats like an armored apricot stone, held to the ground with cables. A stenciled inscription runs along the armor plates of the ship. Ru 501, a Samaran brand of small airship. High above the hospital, the tarpaulin cover flutters like a flag. Zygismund Berg watches from the landing pad as it twists into the pail. He starts climbing up a cable. After only half an hour, 
The hermetic door opens inward with a hiss. Oxygen flows out of the cockpit. The porthole and gauge covers fog up from the change in atmosphere. A sweaty Sigismund Berg climbs in through the door. The small bedroom-sized space shakes with his effort, and the ship sways. He throws the anorak coat to the floor angrily, and resolves to never wear it again. It's practical, that's for sure, and even a uniform for an entrepreneur. But for him personally, the jacket is associated with a fad that his eyes should never have seen. Disco. The man starts pulling up the ropes tied to his waist. He still doesn't say anything, not a word, even though he's covered in bruises from falling. He doesn't even swear. First comes the backpack, then the goat legs. And last of all, two fuel oil canisters clank against the hull of the ship. He collapses against the wall, exhausted, and rests there for a moment, rolls a smoke, and puts it behind his ear, pulls out the rolled-up maps. Matchbox held between his teeth. He lines up the maps on the wall of cockpit devices. Aerial photographs are lined up in a row. The dark green taiga of Nad Umai, a cluster of concrete boxes in Nemeng Ul. And next to it, the former border of the world, as if drawn in gray watercolor. A huge empty mess full of azimuths, ellipses, and sinusoids begins where the world ends. And even farther away, from this geometric maze, in the most magnificent of solitudes, in the eye of the cycle, where no destination leads, runs a line of tiny dots, a distant constellation, a superposition. This is the terminus. Rodionov's trench is located in the heart of the Pale, 4,000 kilometers from the edge of the world. It could take years to fly there. He looks down, and on his hand, tattooed on his white knuckles, are numbers strung along like pearls in a necklace. Five, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Sigismund Berg turns the ignition key. Lights come on in the cockpit. Fog lights up, golden in the middle of the pale. A buzz of electricity passes through the airship like a purr. Needles jump behind the indicator glasses. Welcome, Entrepreneur. The man presses the button on the ship's stereo 8 player labeled Start in Samaran lettering. The label on the disc says, in a girl's swooshy handwriting, Ziggy's Ride to the End of the World mixtape. When the tape starts spinning, the heart will be in the middle of the last I of the name Ziggy. Rock music from the 50s, from a now burned out band of Surue's drunkards, plays from the transistor radio. It's a beautiful song, which, unfortunately, the bourgeois didn't understand. Track one, Helvetti, was too complex, too dark, and the lyrics were too intense for their established womb-shaped musical taste. May they rot in hell. By the time the pale invades the corners of their kitchens and turns them into protein masses, the members of this ensemble, which, despite their best efforts, haven't garnered a large audience, will have already drunk themselves to death in front of the Lemin K's village store. Ziggy lights the smoke. He nods his head to the rhythm in the middle of the cockpit, wearing a Karakul sweater. These tunes are the real deal. They say it like it is. But something is missing. You forgot your jacket, Ziggy, says the destruction in the darkness in a girl's voice. But Ziggy doesn't dare to open his swollen eyes. He knows what really awaits him there. The scent of snow is all around, in his broken capillaries. Oh, bourgeois perfume. Yoo-hoo! The destruction sings. Your jacket! Tell me, destruction. 
Ziggy croaks in the dark space of winter. Is it a rad jacket? A pretty rad jacket, yeah. The zippers jingle above him. Blood flows into his mouth. A snowball melts in his eye socket. He coughs. Clever destruction. So you... like jackets? I do. And you know who I am? Of course. The destruction exclaims happily. You're Ziggy, the baddest boy in school. Twenty-one years later, Ziggy Smuntberg opens the ship's toolbox. There's a black leather jacket lying on top of the wrenches. It's his jacket. He pulls it on. The shoulders no longer sit properly. His back has developed a hunch. The zipper doesn't close around the beer belly either. But so be it. It's rad like that. He leaves it open. There are seven white stripes running down the back. And they still look totally evil. Like this, the entrepreneur stands in the cockpit door of this airship and tosses his ponytail over his shoulder. Surui's rock echoes outside in the frozen pale. The harmonica howls. You could say that Ziggy is self-chilling there at the door. But which is the land? It is hell. He hums along and hits the danger button with his palm. Thus the clatter of the iron frame sounds over the beginning of the beat. The propeller landing gear falls down. The ship begins to rattle to the music, her propellers unfolding in the pail like luxuriant steel pedals, the blades hanging down. And what comes next is the song's most intense lyrical passage. It is not a scary place, he sings, and the familiar upside-down echo joins him. Together, they are mighty one last time. Rather, it is sad there. The ghostly gray cytoplasm of Ignis Nielsen stands on the landing platform below, between the unfolding propeller blades. Zygismund stares at him, and Ignis looks back at Zygismund. The pail flows in and out of the beating heart of the cytoplasm. Ignis is only a slightly brighter clump in the ascending far pale. The enemy of matter drifts through him, like wings. Communism forgives you, he says. Communism understands. Ignis, mutters the entrepreneur, forgive me. Already done. We also had a man of your measure in Grad. Ion Rodionov was his nom de guerre. I also considered him a friend. I guess you know that name? Because of the trench. You don't know who he was? He was a mathematician of the revolution, at the top of the party, with me and Mazov. No one knows that. No one knows why he took the Harnoncourt model from Grad with him. But I don't know that. The cigarette drops from Ziggy Spunt's mouth. Of course you don't know. Only the Commissar of the Revolution and a handful of close associates know this. This man is a real non-entity. His whole life's work is like this. If they were already unable to accept dialectical materialism, how would we have explained nihil mat to them? Zygismund is silent. The song ends. He wanted to use it as a weapon of mass negation against the bourgeoisie. That would have been our answer to a nuclear weapon. You know there is no uranium in Samara. We found it says the SRV entrepreneur. The ropes holding the airship down snap loose like whips. Too bad. I've never been too fond of that wing of materialism. Terrible if they were right. I love the world. Every last atom of it. 
What if the world doesn't love our idea anymore? You and Rodionov will be second best. My name is also a military name, says Ignis Nielsen. And at least that way, we're not prey anymore. The world's saddest screeching starts to sound from the transistor radio. Track number two, Grave, by the vanished dodecaphonic composer, Comte de Peru's Maitrecy. Goodbye, Sigismund. Goodbye, Ignis, says the entrepreneur, and closes the door of the airship behind him. Ignis is left alone on the roof of the hospital. Rather, it is sad there. The ghost still hums as the propellers start to spin through his cytoplasm. Slowly at first, but their blades move faster and faster. Sigismund Berg stands in front of the porthole with his hands on the levers. The levers rise from the gearboxes in the floor like two forked horns. The man turns on the transistor radar. He tunes the device to a hidden radio station. The computer, half the size of the wall, calculates the ship's course based on its transmission. The signal comes from the countless different points, a superstition constellation, 4,000 kilometers away. From the transistor radio, he hears the speech component in the vibration of the strings. The kitten-voiced girl repeats there, in an endless circle through all time, what for her, looking from Rodionov's trench, is one and the same, a simultaneous and immeasurably complex event, a perfect closed system. Azimuth, Boreas, Sinus, Aureole, Laudanum, Ultra, Tricolor, Ellipse, Natir, Ellipse, Gamut, Azimuth. Tricolor, Econ, Oriole, Nadir. The entrepreneur pulls the levers down and back. His eyes are red. The airship takes off from the landing platform on the roof of the hospital. The propellers pull the pail into spirals. The blades sweep Ignis Nielsen apart. Two men wave in a snowstorm that flickers blue-red from flashing lights. They fall into the distance slowly as the platform of the floating station is left behind in the blizzard. Therese opens his eyes in the sky. He can't feel his legs. Everything spins, and the air ambulance's propellers flap around noisily. A man in a black suit stands over him, illuminated by the heart monitor screen. This man is the man from Internal Affairs. He is the angel of death. I can't feel my legs, coughs Therese. This is what happens when you open fire on the ICP. You, Therese tries to sit up, but his wrists are bound to the first aid frame. How? Unfortunately, I cannot answer this question. Konchalovsky, the former agent sinks back into the frame. I give you Ulrich, but Konchalovsky doesn't exist. How could you... who would... He starts to tear his right wrist from the cuff. You're a drug addict, Maciek. That's why. People like you are always careless. How many years have you been doing this before that man had a heart attack? Two... Five? The man from Internal Affairs starts to straighten up, but the cuff on Therese's wrist pops open, and the man's cannulated hand grabs him by the tie. You... Therese coughs in his face, his tie clenched in his fist. You have to help me! His partner is already approaching with a gun, but the agent waves him back. Wait! I found things... In Vasa, about one close investigation. Derek Trentmuller is his name. He's killed children, twenty or more, and maybe Lund's children too. Please, let go. 
The fallen agent lets go of his tie and collapses. I have a notebook. Everything is in there. Promise me. I wouldn't have run otherwise. You have to follow up on those. The angel of death stands over him and wipes the blood off his tie. The koiko scrabbles around far below, looking for his notebook. You could get a medal for this. A promotion for sure. The man from Internal Affairs turns his back on him, and his partner rushes over to tie Teresa's hands back to the frame. Please, comes his broken voice over the noise of the engine, Ty fluttering in the wind of the propellers. The investigator looks at the city as he descends from the belly of the airship. Leave it, Machiek. Derek Trent Merler has nothing to do with it. These disappearances have not been reported. A subtle shade of humanity runs through his voice. That's the only beautiful thing about this story. In the foreground, the lights of the hospital's landing platform flash in the storm. In the background, the spiked throne of new skyscrapers rises out of the city's light. There, an oil billionaire watches as the tiny dot of light from the ambulance airship disappears into the wind on the other side of the Vera River. News thoughts cool before him, rates drop, and Grodd goes to war. General mobilization starts tomorrow. There's not much left. Over 3,000 pieces of disappearance memorabilia are spread out behind the man. But now, Saryan and Bartsumyan considers this view to be the jewel of his collection. A magnetic post-shipment, a glass display case that arrived from Vasa on the evening train, rests under his hand. It is empty. Chapter 19 I Am No Joke Forty-six hours later, and sixty floors below, the hotel lobby is empty at night, and it shines like a tomb of black marble. At the reception desk, the girl is anxiously listening to the radio about how Mesk's nuclear cruisers are spying from within the far pale, while industrial espionage lurks right here. They are everywhere. The war news is still echoing from the hall when a man in a windbreaker comes through the automatic doors. A storm cloud accompanies him as he rushes in. In the background run the glowing white letters, Hotel Intergrad. The girl doesn't notice him, and the security guard is also transfixed with sphere, so the guests walk right past them, into the resident's private elevator. The doors close behind him. Alone in the golden light of the elevator, he flips his backpack over to his chest, the loop still on his shoulders, like he was taught in sixth grade. Don't do it like that, Khan. It's totally spiffin' like that. Khan searches for something in the side pocket of his bag. A bunch of keys come into view with a jingling of metal. Among them hangs the key to the lock of his wooden house in Salem, the jagged hammer for the hallway and the aluminum mass to lock himself in the basement, all of them useless scrap metal. All but one, a golden key, the bidding of which seems to be sophisticated and high-tech, as if turning such keys simultaneously would trigger a self-destruct protocol, a dead hand type perimeter defense, an attack guaranteed even in the event of the high command's demise in a preemptive nuclear strike. Khan inserts his doomsday key into a keyhole and turns as instructed, left twice, then right, then left again. Ambartsumyan Saryan Astorovich is engraved on the copper plate below the keyhole. The hiss of a speaker cuts through the silence of the elevator. Mr. Embartsumyan, I was worried. I'm not Mr. Embartsumyan. I'm Inayat Khan. The man demonstrates the key, unable to decide where he should point it. 
He can only see himself in the mirrors, his pom-pom hat askew, and the shoulders of his windbreaker dusted with melting snow. He's unshaven. He looks terrible. I was given this for emergency situations. What's going on now? Why don't you answer my calls? You talk like Ismail. Sorry, what? You just talk like Ismail. Oh, do you remember Ismail? I'm Ismail, replies the faithful secretary, and the elevator jolts into movement. A sense of acceleration goes through Khan. You were worried? Why? Why didn't you pick up? I... The secretary hesitates. I haven't been in touch with the gentleman for two days. The last instruction was to stop all calls and not let anyone in. And that was the day before yesterday? Yes, when the gentleman received your shipment in the Yat Khan. Acknowledged, Khan nods to the mirror, slush melting on the lenses of his glasses. He takes them off and wipes them on the sleeve of his windbreaker. And nothing else has come? Meanwhile? From the ICP? As I said, I haven't heard from the gentleman. Right, yes. The elevator cube slides silently upward, towards the sky. Khan's ears want to close up from the pressure change. He swallows, circles the elevator, then stands facing the door, backpack still on his chest. Mr. Khan, the loudspeaker suddenly crackles. Yes? Please check that everything is fine with the gentleman. Tell him I asked to be contacted. Why wouldn't it be? The elevator slows down. Khan's arms lift from his sides as if he were weightless. Why wouldn't everything be fine with the gentleman? He asks. But the secretary doesn't answer. The elevator doors open in front of Khan. Ping! A beam of light cuts into the dark of the hall, on the sixtieth floor. The wind howls causing covers to billow around their display cases like ghosts. And the snow blows in. This is how the world's largest private collection of disappearance memorabilia is slowly being buried in mounds of snow. The tapping of shoes on linoleum can be heard. The man from internal affairs comes down the hospital corridor at night, a briefcase phone dangling from his hand locked to his wrist with a chain. A tiny forget-me-not shines on his lapel, a light blue enamel badge. Two policemen guard the doors of the intensive care unit. One is asleep. Why are you asleep? The internal affairs agent leans over him. I'm a mesk infiltrator, and there's a five kiloton explosive in this suitcase. The officer opens his eyes and rubs them in bewilderment. His partner looks on in horror. In the form of Morova Central Hospital, we have just lost an irreplaceable strategic resource. Three thousand citizens of Grad have perished because you didn't do your job. The officer jumps to his feet and puffs up his chest, his expression still confused with sleep. The man from internal affairs is unrelenting. What are you standing here for? Does it make any difference if you sleep standing up? Who am I? Where's my proof of employment? Why haven't I presented my guest name tag? The metal double door swings shut behind the detective as he walks down the dark hall, and the officers in the corridor breathe a sigh of relief. Cubes separated by plastic curtains pass him on both sides. The last one by the window glows with medical equipment. The man turns on his heel and pulls open the plastic curtains. Machiek, I need you to call your friends. I need you to ask them to come back. Now. There's a morphine drip on the headboard, and in it, the morphine drips. This isn't a good sign. The power should have been shut off a long time ago. The crushed agent looks out the window, where it's snowing heavily. You have nothing to give me. I don't have anything to give you. I know your stories, not reported. You know nothing about the research. You're a duke. 
Ziava. People like you only haunt. Duch. Ziava. They're usually bored citizens who entertain themselves by weaving webs of lies against all the types of ghosts and specters that hover through the state apparatus. People like us, Machiak. People like us are the agents of the collaboration police. The purpose of the collaboration police is not to investigate. The purpose of the collaboration police is the continuation of the world in its current form. Machiak turns his gaze away from the window. This world of yours in its current form is one hell of a shithole. Wow, the man from Internal Affairs feigns surprise. Such philosophy. So you like St. Moreau's plan for humanity? The only nihilist here is you, Duch. So you don't like St. Moreau and his plan for humanity? The man's features sharpen as he walks closer to the bed, into the green glow of the heart monitor. But even more abnormal stuff suits you? Or do you not want to know what company your friend keeps? Your abnormal friend? I didn't know either. What is their hobby? What do they do? Machiak sits up, the bandage on his shoulder staining red with his defiance. You mean Khan? Khan is a genius. You can't stop him. Yes, the man from Internal Affairs shrugs. He knows what he's doing, unlike you. I would call him and ask him to come back now. This concession is enough for the likes of Machiak. I think that's a no, old man. Stop asking. Better turn the morph up. I can't reach it. He sinks into the hospital pillow. Luckily, the spasms of his laughter hurt him, and he can't revel in the moment anymore. I think you've had enough drugs. Drugs, mocks Machiak. The internal affairs agent looks at him with disdain. Below him, in the hospital bed, lays the sweaty body of a man, his bare upper body bleeding, exuding sweat. So you like it here, yes? Are you satisfied with your lot, Konchalovsky? Therese floats in the morphine solution. Dark waves wash over him. Flakes of snow fall into the water. He burns cold. A chance. A child's hands keep him afloat by the shoulders. Tiny, strong hands. He's a soldier of love. Yes, he replies, and watches the green dot bounce on the heart monitor. Calmingly, rhythmically. It's okay here. They say I won't be able to walk normally anymore, but you know what? I wasn't planning on going anywhere. I hate this country. I hate Grodd. I hate the collaboration police and the moral intern, too. It's only a tool for me. I myself am only a tool. I do know why I'm here. Who turned me in? Don't waste your breath. I'm not an idiot. I know that my work is done. The light green line is left behind in the dark. What did he get for me? Khan, what did you give him? The wind howls and sneakers leave prints in the deep snow on the top floor. The world's leading expert on evaporation treads carefully, snowflakes dancing in and out of focus. And there beyond them, his diamaterialist glasses, sharp, dark eyes watching, flakes sticking to his lenses. The man crouches slowly, his windbreaker rustling. He reaches out and picks something up from a mound of snow. The wind dies down. The display covers droop lifelessly. The dark fabric takes the form of display cases again, and Inayat Khan is there in the midst of them, on one knee, holding a human skull. He looks deep into the blackness of its eye sockets. Sixty thousand real dropped, far from here, in the desert of Erg. 
where the hero of the epic went to ask God for an audience. Sixty thousand deep holes have been dug, in vain. Khan blows, and snow flies from Ramut Karzai's eyes, his chin clamped shut and his mouth mute. Spear broken, flag cloth for a funeral shroud. Mr. Ambartsumyan! Khan rises, a flag worn by time ripples on the wall, pulled taut with ropes. It's immense, in the colors of the Ilmaran tricolor. A gust of wind picks up, and a scarf of the same colors flutters around the man's neck. A hat of the same colors is on his head. Ambartsumyan! Khan goes along, running his hand over the glass cases. The splintered shaft of a spear and an antique rusted spearhead peek out from under the snow. We have to talk! The ominous shadow of the pom-pom hat shifts to the desk, where papers are flying about, and the step pyramid phone is buried in the snow. The hand in the elongated shadow of the elevator beam suddenly twitches like an aberration. There's a grunt of strain, and then, whoa! The skull shatters into a thousand pieces against the speakerphone. Where are my things? Where are they? The man approaches, tipping over display cases on the way. Display glass shatters. I don't like it when my things are lost. I don't like it one bit. He stops, two hands on the mahogany, and in one fell swoop, he wipes the table clean of paper and stationery. How am I supposed to know where you put it now? He stares all around the room. Didn't we have a talk about this? Wasn't there a talk? You get the ship, you mediate. Everyone gets their things. Where are my things? He shouts. Out of the corner of his eye, he briefly catches sight of a row of floor-to-ceiling windows. The middle one, the largest of the windows, is shattered from the inside. The triangular shards of glass point outward, and snow is billowing in, along with glowing golden Mirova light. In front of the window, in a big pile of snow, gleams an upended display case, bare wires, a switch. Khan turns his head and erupts from the spot, leaving a paper painting behind him on the end wall above the desk. Snow-damp paper waves there in the wind. A watercolor gonsu gradually bleeds across the material. The black of the dragon's whiskers sends jellyfish-like tentacles into the rib sails. The reed armor turns into a rainbow. Soon he will be gone, but you can still see how gonsu distributes peaches of immortality to his men. One for you, one for you, and one for you. But Khan has no eyes for that. He digs, the wind whistling in his ears. He's got his mittens on. The display case emerges from the snow, and the man turns it right side up, pulls papers out of it, expensive papers, a folder with a collaboration police pennant, an X-ray of someone's exposed teeth. An ID photo flies from the folder into the wind. A bluish tattoo, an impossible reminder on knuckles. Five, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Khan catches the photo and stuffs it in the backpack on his chest, along with the others. With false passage papers from the People's Republic of Kokushkina, Grod Samaran Oblast, these papers sit on top of the stuff in his backpack with the upside-down pentagon printed on white passport paper. At the bottom of the display case shines the grand prize, Rodionov's trench. Khan's mouth drops open. He reaches out. The perforated dark blue metal sheet sings like a saw blade between his fingers, the light of the city shining through the thousands of specks. Alongside the dots runs the legend of the map, in Voronikin's handwriting. He reads, and the starry sky shines on his tanned face.
Matryek smiles sadly. Was it good? The man from Internal Affairs doesn't answer, opening his suitcase phone on Therese's knees. The lights come on inside, and his own dove-embalmed notebook slides off the keys, the photopaper occasionally glinting. Strange. It had to be something very good, the man thinks for a moment. Now you have a citizen of Vasa whose comings and goings you cannot control. Is that right? You can't do anything to him. He's a collaborator. But he outplayed you. You didn't even know what things you gave him. They were not good, Machiak, shouts the internal affairs agent. I was wrong. I was more wrong than you think, and he won't like it. Your own suspect is the victim. He picks up the notebook. What do you think about why your cases haven't been reported? You saw them, Machiak. Let's talk about that. Or do you not want to anymore? You don't want to talk about Derek Trent Merler? It's not funny anymore, is it? The internal investigator puts his hand on the man's blistering hot forehead. These things happened. You saw them with your own eyes. And now they haven't happened. How is that possible? Those things have nothing to do with this. Therese gasps, his pupils covering his hazel irises. You said so yourself. Only Khan's plan matters now. Khan's plan is the height of abnormality. Rodionov's trench. Mentally ill communists, for fuck's sake, poking around, and all of you live in that kind of world. You think about those things. You work with them. You like all kinds of objects, yes? I have one, too. It reached me today from Vasa. I had it resent to me by Telefax five times. The man shakes his head angrily. It was always the same. It was always just the same. Let me show you a photo, Machiek, because otherwise you won't behave like an adult, and you apparently don't care about your friends either, after your great sacrifice. He takes the photo paper from the notebook. This here is the only one of Dirk Trent Merler's assets that corroborates your story. He developed it himself in his lab. You saw it too, with your machine. The date of development is August 29 of 52. Two days later, he sent this along with a negative to the Vossen photo lab. The negative is not corrupted. The developed picture is the same. A month later, upon a follow-up request, the central photo laboratory confirms the negative is not corrupted. The developed picture is the same. Zeul confirms that there are no defects in the lens and Trigot takes 300 test shots with the camera equipment. There are no deviations. This man studied this device for six years until his memory started fading. I think he would have studied it for a lifetime, like you. Therese holds the photo paper with its ragged edges, the date and stamp on the back, August 29 of 52. Turn it around. His sweat leaves a stain on the paper. Photolab stamps. Zeul. Trigat. You don't dare to look at it, do you? You shouldn't be able to dare. No one should. No one should deal with something like this. They must be forgotten. But Machiek, I'm sorry. I need you to call your friends back here. You have to do it. The light slides over the surface of the glossy photo when Therese turns it over. There is a faded summer day, frozen in place. The rain is falling on the cliff, and in front of the rose bush stands the three of them, young, with triumphant smiles on their faces. Khan explains about peaches and gonzu, and he and Jesper look ahead with a beach umbrella in hand. Three boys hold the beach umbrella over nothing. What is this? The dot on the heart monitor freezes. That's where your friends are going. 
This is your Rodionov's trench. You've retouched it. Therese turns the paper over, panicking as if he's searching for them on the flip side. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this to me? We don't do anything. There are no Dukas and Ziavas, you junkie. We are friends of mankind. When will you understand? It's not a person that retouched it. You just don't want to think about it. None of you want to. And that's how it should be. Let's leave it at that. The man from Internal Affairs picks up the receiver and presses the redial key. The dial tone plays. Therese turns his head away, but the internal investigator takes him by the chin. Don't stop now. You haven't only done bad things. You fix them both, Heard and Trent Merler. You remove that horror from their heads. We're almost there. A woman's voice comes from the receiver. The photo slips from Therese's fingers. But that's not possible. That is, indeed, not possible, sighs the angel of death. Only the world in its current state is possible. We don't investigate those things. We don't prod at them. We come to terms. We forget. We wait, and we are protected. Please connect me to suite number 4001. Ismail, do you hear me? Khan's voice echoes over the switchboard. The faithful secretary stands in front of a mess of cables, thousands of metal plugs running into analog sockets. Lights flash. He has a pink shirt peeking out of his jacket collar. With a click-click, the young man switches the wires on the table with proficiency. I'm listening. The gentleman has jumped to his death. I hope you understand I didn't have to tell you. I could have just left the building. I hope you understand and call the authorities only after ten minutes have passed. The gentleman would have wanted it to be that way. So that I wouldn't be stopped. So that the investigation wouldn't waste my time. So decrees Khan, the wind howling in the background. Time I don't have. Can you understand me? Say that you understand and that you'll do as I asked. From behind the speaker, there's an intermittent rumble, like crying. Do you understand? He repeats, and the speakerphone hisses. Ten minutes. Very well. Khan turns his head and looks down. The expanse shines beneath his feet. A man who was afraid that the world was disappearing threw himself out there. But for a while now, Khan hasn't feared anything anymore. Nu lays before him, and thoughts run deep behind his glasses and eyelids. Organized. Strategic. It's a massive rescue operation, and he's made entirely out of it now. With no other thoughts left. They still call him Khan, but in fact, he is a tactical guide perfected through twenty years of trench warfare. An adaptive maneuver, the author and executor of which is himself, the tyrant of love, a total worldview in the service of a single person. There are others, but he can't be stopped. Horrors visit him. Lately he can't even recall their names. He gets their ages mixed up. His companion looks at him before he falls asleep, a vague shape of from oblivion instead of a face. A new motor of horrors. And even uglier are the nightly long-distance calls from the trench. You know who I am. Fat man, I'm not your plaything. Leave us be. How he cried when he woke up. But it doesn't happen anymore. Countermeasures have gone into effect. He knows what happened, and he will remember forever. So stands the man at the broken window of the building's 60th floor, a turquoise-orange-violet shroud fluttering from his shoulders. 
He is a superhero. Girls, he is coming to save you. He walks with his overfilled backpack across the snow-covered floor, down the fire escape stairs. There, he exchanges the resident's private elevator for the guests. He descends 19 floors with a vespertine businessman and his escorts, conjures a smile, then steps out onto the 40th and wipes it from his face. Half an hour before the electrician has broken into the elevator door downstairs, and 45 minutes before Khan steps out of the parking lot and onto the snowy street, he enters the suite booked under his friend's name without taking off his shoes. It's dark in the hallway. Khan doesn't turn on the lights. He knows what this means. Three thousand real worth of worn, smooth suede shoes huddle on the shoe rack. A beige Perseus black pea coat splattered with blood hangs on the coat rack. It's become too morbid for Jesper. The phone rings in the empty rooms. The man follows it into the bedroom, where the bed is made, the air is fresh, and on a cubicle white table in the middle of the room sits a dark step pyramid. It's built from stacks of jet black cash. Khan unpacks the backpack on his stomach, moves the shroud to the sports bag, and starts to load the stacks of money into his rucksack, accompanied by a cold ringing. A hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, one hundred thousand, five hundred thousand real, eight hundred thousand real. Therese's service weapon rests beneath it all, as if in a tomb. The nickel shines in the dim light. He puts it on top of everything else in his backpack, then gets up. Khan looks at the phone on the empty table. The red light blinks on and off, along with the ringtone. It stops for a moment. Half a minute passes, and then it starts again. The man puts his hand on the receiver, thinks. His fingers get sweaty. He picks up the receiver and places it back on the hook. Then he picks it up again, this time placing it against his ear. Dark yellow fingers move on the buttons. When the series of sixteen digits is finished, there is silence from the receiver, then an intermittent dial tone, a signal to another world. And when the receiver is finally lifted on the other side, the pale fills the entire room. Connection, like a distant ocean. The voice is barely audible in the breaking of the waves. Hello? Mom, I'm not coming home anymore. Two months later, 4,000 kilometers to the north, on the other side of the Yucatan Reserve, the former taiga of northeastern Grad stretches to the curve of the horizon, silver glowing pale in the immeasurable distance. An 800 million hectare sea of trees waves in the wind in front of him. The world, the snow-speckled expanse, breathes oxygen into the winter evening atmosphere. Even the indigenous people are forbidden to go here. All of Grad breathes these icy cubic tons. They are its lungs, Grad's lungs. Hydrometeorological Reserve, Oxygen Park. A storm gray motor carriage stands on the forest road at the edge of a large field. The cabin lights dimming inside as the lead acid battery slowly discharges. The glass domes of the headlights fade into the twilight of late December. A pump cord winds out of the machine's oil tank. A 34-year-old man holds an empty canister in his hand. The snow-white interior in front of him smells of fuel. The white seats drip with it, as do the steering levers and the armature made of white leather. He strikes a match. It goes out between his cold red fingers as the wind blows around him. The man hides the box with his palm and strikes another one. 
the first one does nothing. After one more, the motor carriage bursts into flames. A single candle flares to life in the midst of a dimming world. The white skin crackles black as it burns. Charcoal flakes peel and rise up. A white suitcase lights up in the back seat. There, his passport curls up like a dying spider. The cover's whistling. The light ash of Malin's letters floats into the air, along with all the rest of the memorabilia that hasn't disappeared anywhere else yet. The drawing lights up before his eyes. The birthmarks on Ani's back disappear. The heat washes over the man's face. He closes his eyes. The specks dance there for a moment, and the pair of eyes, the exact color of which he's no longer sure of, a face that no longer comes to mind. One kiss with the teacher's daughter in the twilight of the forest, which his tongue cannot remember, but without which he himself would be unthinkable. It all fades. The former interior designer pulls back his lips, rubs his bleeding gums with powder, and throws the rest of the nose candy into the burning motor car. It sparkles when it catches fire. Then he picks up speed and leaps across the iced over stream. Below, a tuft of reed sticks out of the ice, behind which a forest road meanders. In front of him lies a meadow of fumitories. It snows above the meadow, and the sawtooth-like wall of spruces behind it, a zigzag dream. Bands of snow drift from the tree branches into the wind like wedding ribbons. He goes, a lock of blonde hair fluttering on his forehead. His eyes bright blue and damp from the wind. He wears a snow-white peacoat for this occasion and has shoes of white chamois on his feet. The corners of his coat collar have silver anchors, a nautical motif. His silhouette glows in the dim light, slender as a surfboard, water bottles clinking in his messenger bag. No one knows where he's going. No one knows where he is. A tiny shining dot in a wide field of frost. And on the other side of the field, the forest border is waiting. The twilight under the trees is filled to the brim with oxygen. It has invited all conscious life inside. He enters. The carpet of tree needles is springy under his feet. The wind dies down, and no bells ring there, no one's voice. It's better this way. It's right this way. A charred motor carriage is left behind on the roadside. A month later, 6,000 kilometers to the south, a metro train whizzes through an underground tunnel. The carriages are empty at night. The steel whines. Khan leans against the door, backpack on his back. He looks down at the line of carriages twisting in the bend, the steel stomach of the metro. Only a few people sit there, under the lights turned to economy mode. The nation of Grad is at war, and going out at night without a special permit is prohibited. One night, when the officers came to beat him with rubber batons at the train station, Khan bought one for himself. Now he sleeps on station benches and at the tables of all-night cafes and avoids hotels. People have a habit of getting lost there. The yellow light of industry pours in window after window as the metro train exits the tunnel and climbs up onto a bridge. Down below runs the blackened undercurrent of Perimenaya Vera, with a rainbow-colored layer floating on top. Ahead, on the banks of the river, rise the giant cylinders of gas storage tanks, the rows of floodlights for the cucumber plantation, and there, the hydroelectric plant. This is polyfabricate, Tyrannopol, the type of human settlement after the metropolis 
the penultimate stage of development. The part that Khan has visited once before was Lenka, the capital of Ziemsk. Frantichek the Brave was born there, and Therese Machiek too. But by then, Lenka had already been swallowed up by the tumor for some time. Gradian researchers predict that within the next ten years, the polyfabricate will grow and merge with Mirova and its suburbs to form the last stage of the development of human settlement, the uninhabitable part of the geosphere, the zone of ecological disaster, the necropolis. It won't get to that. Long before that happens, the pale will have wiped out this part of the country. On the horizon, above the bay, the black hulls of Gradian cruisers drift to the northwest, swarms of destroyers spilling from their bellies like spores. These are reserve forces. Tonight, Mesk's fleet had invaded the Grad Isola, the home Isola. There's no good news from the Holodnaya Zemlya Oblast in Katla either. The castling approaches over the boreal plateau. Thirty-five million people are listening to the war news via broadcasting, outside the train window in the polyfabricate. They are all Koikos. Only one doesn't listen. He already knows what will happen. This man is a nihilist, and he's the person Khan has followed here. Khan steps out the door at the stop and zips up his jacket. The platform is empty and quiet, with the chill of the late southern winter. Poplar trees rustle in the wind. Industrial ash falls from tree branches. The man descends the rattling stairs down to street level and passes between half-dilapidated shacks. The waste disposal facility towers above, an invincible monument, its silver cylinders gleaming under 5,000-watt floodlights. The street itself is poorly lit. Wooden houses line both sides of the road, and ice crackles underfoot in mud puddles. The road is unpaved. Khan stops in front of a two-story shack in particularly bad shape. The wood facade of the building creaks in a gust of wind, threatening to collapse on top of him at any moment. He checks the address written on the back of his hand with a pen, then goes up the stairs into the cat-piss and ammonia-scented darkness of the hallway. A match lights up, and two tongues of fire dance in the curve of Khan's lenses as he searches for apartment number three. There, an old man in his underwear comes to the door, his skin drooping on his chest as if embalmed. Once he had been young and charming in his radical worldview, laughing at everything and everyone, and calmly accepting the little things that would derail an ordinary person. That sort of clowning around, together with the social guilt characteristic of a Nordic woman, earned this Koiko the best luck of his life. Ziggy's mother. However, the marriage turned out to be a farce for him. Moreover, she didn't allow herself to be disciplined whenever Ziggy's nihilistic father wanted. Ziggy wasn't disciplined by his father. His father cared for him. Enough to leave the boy behind in Vasa, anyways. The nihilist, fond of dishing out abuse himself, went back to the polyfabricate, lifted weights, and kept his health in order to live to be a hundred years old. Like a true nihilist, savoring every nasty hour, knowing there are many more to come. All this is clear to Khan. He has it in a folder in his backpack. He wants to know what happened when Ziggy came to his father in Grad three years after the girls disappeared. What had happened between Ziggy and the girls. What he had left behind. The Koiko runt leads him to the kitchen, between the unwashed dishes. Khan throws a bottle of vodka and a hundred real on the oilcloth-covered table. The Koiko runt unscrews the cap, a shot glass pinched between his middle and index fingers. It's not that I want to cause any trouble for him with this. Don't get me wrong. Khan looks at the filled glass in front of him. Everything is as I said on the phone, but... 
He thinks for a moment, and then pours the vodka down his throat. The boy does know who I am. I'm a nihilist. The old man slams his glass on the table, too. Behold the mighty nihilist as he stands eye to eye with death. Tonight at eight o'clock in the community center. Death is great and terrible, but... But a nihilist isn't a... What was it now? He puts his finger to his mouth and tries to remember. But the spirit doesn't return. The mood is spoiled, and his body sags from the shoulders. Soon it'll be over. What's the difference now, anyway? The old man nods towards the door. Everything is as he left it. Stacks of notebooks rise like towers against the walls. Khan's silhouette stands in front of the door, between the stacks, the kitchen light shining in from behind him. Then, when he reaches for one of the notebooks, the rest of the stacks start to collapse on top of him. He looks to Ziggy's father for help, his shoulder propping the swaying tower up against the wall. Let it be, Ziggy's father coughs. Everything is the same. All the same story. What do you mean? Khan takes a step back. Graph paper notebooks spill onto the floor. The girls' ages written on each cover in Ziggy's sloppy handwriting. Five, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. One and the same story, I tell you. The Koiko runt turns his back on Khan and sits down at the table. A weird tale. It's a rather weird tale for all of us. And does it have a happy ending? Now. Khan begins to pack the notebooks into his sports bag. As he stands in front of the door with his bulging bag over his shoulder, the Koiko runt is still looking out the small window of the kitchen. They want to sink this world into the pail, you know. The mesks. They say on the radio that the mangers are coming. That we all just stand there, mouths agape, and make sure we don't choke on our own tongues as they feed us. A failure. It's no longer nihilism. It's a farce. I've seen it. It's the protein mass quarantine of Lomonosov's land. He wants to turn the whole world into Lomonosov's land. Khan taps the toe of his shoe on the doormat. Well, then, I guess I should head out now. Isn't he a disappointment, this Saint Miro? But you know, boy... The old man looks at Khan, his eyes shiny with vodka, black as a horse's. I think there's more to come from there. The light in the carriages go out in front of Khan one after the other, as the tunnel swallows the train. He sits by the window, in hollow silence, his ears blocked up by the change in pressure. Green lights mark the exit, otherwise the carriages are dark. The steel whines. He takes out a flashlight and fills it with batteries, and the world on the graph paper appears in his lap out of the darkness. Khan sits with the stacks of notebooks on his right and reads. Page after page untangles in front of him, in the beams of his flashlight. Every detail is recorded there, with the attention span of an autist, every word and movement documented. It's not so much a story as a technical drawing, an industrial model of a memory. Instructions to the benevolent power of the future that could put Sigismund Berg's lost world back together. Cut, fold, paste. The trajectory of the brick in the winter night, the coordinates of the living room window. A familiar address, the girl's house in Vasa. At the Falu stop, the suburban maze appears on a fold-out map. The dotted line represents the fleeing boy and there are meteorological details in the corner of the page. Air pressure and humidity. Eighteen degrees below freezing. The next night, 
at handsome Alexander's, couches against the wall, a six-phase fight recorded as dance steps on the floor, and then a great darkness, a single voice ringing above him, above the boy with the zippers on his jacket. You're Ziggy, the baddest boy in school. Khan gets a bad feeling. He wipes his glasses in a handkerchief, and acid swirls in his stomach. This is an impending fit of jealousy. And you, clever destruction, are the most beautiful girl in school. However, on turning the page, the girl's name, familiar with its circle A in the middle, is not waiting for him. There awaits its absence. He and the world around him are no more. The dates under the pages start from New Year's Eve, once or twice every week, then less and less as they go, right up until the 28th of August. But the pages themselves are empty. Khan grabs the next notebook from the seat and flips through it, then the next. He pulls the rest of the notebooks out of his backpack, and it's the same story for all of them. A weird tale. The platform light turns the carriages wholly as sieves. It radiates in from the rows of windows, window by window. Khan lifts his head, and his glasses flash. Two glowing portholes, the final stop. He doesn't understand. A fat idiot in a light blue cravat. Somewhere out there is Sigismund Berg, who knows that only shells remain of his tail. The magnetic tape hisses. The heart spins alone on the plastic disc. And the numbers. He has them, too. Inseparable from the world until the end. He catapults toward it through the pale superdeep in his steel apricot pit. Khan's own memory, however, is distorting in his head. The backups have been deleted, one after another, leaving him alone. He can't bear to carry it like this, but he can't live without it. That night he sleeps in the station's toilet, in a cube with cardboard-thin walls. He has curled up against the wall and locked the door, his body is covered by a tricolor shroud, tattered by time. The tassels sweep the floor as the man tosses and turns. He can't sleep. Something is wrong. Something is very wrong. Talk about something. You always have such awesome presentations. In history and science class? The man opens his eyes and looks into the expressionless lump of a face smooth blonde hair falling on the tile. The child is resting on the floor, directly opposite him, doesn't breathe, doesn't smell. Where are you? Low vibration. The invisible companion doesn't respond. Khan pulls himself into a ball as tightly as possible, but the cold doesn't leave his body. He repeats, I am at the end of the world. I am at the end of the world. Twenty-one years ago, little bare feet walked down the stairs of a private house in a suburb. It's the night of the winter solstice, and blood vessels run beneath translucent skin. Each nail is a crimson jewel, her toes curl against the chill of the steps. Dark green eyes. The hem of her nightgown flutters against her calves in the breeze. This is how Malin Lun steps downstairs onto the carpet. A broken window shines in the dark room. Its curtain swells like a sail. A brick lays on the floor, and the front door stands open. She herself is a mirror, a mirror, and in her is a perfect copy of the world. But something is wrong. Always has been. Her surface is flawless, preteen, sparkling clean. 
It is the light that's mistaken. It is the world itself. Two young girls step next to the third in the dark. At the cusp of the oldest one's hand, the fourth, a tiny, good fairy godmother, points towards the window with her wand. The window hangs like a cracked smile on the frames. Look, look, she says. It's going wrong. Chapter 20 Light Shines Through Everything Translator's Note This epilogue is not part of the printed book. It was published in 2014 on Zaum's zaum.ee blog. To paraphrase their own description, it doesn't give anything nor take anything away from the story in the book. Revachal, 75 years ago, two years before the turn of the century revolution. From the main hall of the symphony, applause echoes to the back of the stage. The ovations are mediocre for a first performance, and the second encore doesn't happen. The first one was brought on by the claqueurs. Already, the string section is exchanging their evening gowns for street clothes on silver round-arm sofas. Outside the window, the late January sky is dyed blue, and in front of it stands the Comte Emile de Perus Metrosy in a black redingote, a dodecahedron in his hand, and his finger-waved hair must from conducting. Emile is a contradictory character. He is an aristocrat, the Comte de Perouse and the Comte de Maitrecy, but his hatred of the bourgeoisie, which have usurped the upper classes, makes him a proletarian and therefore a revolutionary. In the course of his life, Emile has also come to think of himself as a composer. He has a morbid thirst for fame, but he's determined to win the hearts of the people with his dodecaphonic works. The Comte's sound is based on a strikingly modern geometric symbolist system of harmonies that has nothing to do with the music of the rest of the civilized world. To the human ear, it sounds like an unacceptable screeching. Emile considers the tonal, traditional sonority to be womb-shaped, a soul soporific babble, the music of amoebas. He conducts his own works, no one else is able to, or even wants to, using a cardboard dodecahedron instead of the traditional baton. The man's cheeks flush with excitement. The dodecahedron trembles in his hand. Am I going back or what? he exclaims. I am. He storms across the room as if driven by a fever. At the door, the director of the symphony orchestra stops the comte in his own discreet way. I don't know. I don't think there's any need to go. Why? The man doesn't understand. A virile smile appears on his lips. But they're calling for me. It was tremendous. Tremendous. The director scratches his head. Well, it was something. But you already went out there once, and it's not a good idea to test the politeness of the audience. The hall has quieted down. The wind blows outside the window. I don't think it was half bad, a fat colleague puts his hand on the comp's shoulder. It was a good idea. The execution could have used a little polish. But you know, by the end, it all came together nicely. So what if it doesn't get a repeat performance? You'll polish the next one to a shine, and then it'll happen. So says the man who mainly writes flute concertos and solo pieces for flutes. Yeah, the next one. The director is still scratching his head. Perhaps it would be better if you didn't write about that. The Comte hears him whispering to the critic. The Peru's maitresses have been generous to our institution over the years. The excitement on the Comte's face turns into a malignant tremor. His smile is faltering. Unnoticed, he returns to the windowsill, past the bustling women. He can hear the director's damage control speech from there, and the critic is speaking too. Complicated. Apparently, 
You don't get famous with this sort of thing. Apparently, it's disturbing to listen to. Beyond the glass, in the dark blue evening, tree branches sway. Disturbing to listen to, whispers the Comte. A metronome stands on the windowsill. He pushes the pendulum to set it ticking. The tempo is grave, the slowest possible. You won't get famous. Well, hold on now, barks the concertmaster. I think the man has a sound that is completely one of a kind. A plump woman looks towards the Comte. I sincerely hope there will be a next time. And then maybe it doesn't have to be quite so complicated. There's a roar of laughter. A sigh of relief passes through the dressing room. By the end, it all came together, the man mumbles. He slowly turns around and looks at the room full of people with a scowl underneath his finger wave bangs. So I'm the only one who thought it was tremendous, then? Tick, the metronome replies. Tree branches sway behind the man. I thought it was peculiar, says the concertmaster. And really, there were some good moments. Good moments, says the comte. Tick, says the metronome. The man juggles his dodecahedron in his hand. But then, which moments did you like best? Well, the beginning of the second part was beautiful. The woman picks at her violin case. And tick, tick, tick. Azimuth! Someone claps their hands together in the silence. Tick. Boreas! Sinus! Eyes aglow like lightning. A tiny man strides across the room. At every beat, he claps his hands together, and with each step, says a word. Nadir! The little man finishes and bows to the Comte. Every single part was absolute mathematical perfection. Don't do a next one. Don't ruin it. Disappear. It needs no more. The man clenches his tiny hands into fists. The elbows of his velvet suit have patches. I'm going back to Grad, he tells the room. In two years' time, a revolution will begin in Mirova, sweeping across the land like a thunderstorm. And its failure will usher in the next century, the century of the twilight of the human mind, each succeeding year darker than the last. He creeps around the room like ball lightning, threatening to pounce onto someone's face at any moment. From the end, there, through the polar night, that music will resound. It will play on future phonographs, on magnets, yet it does not come from there. You'll be famous, Monsieur Mitrissi. Your music will reach us from the true end, even further beyond there, where all matter is but memory. So sounds the white light that shines into every dark room, turning all revelations into nothingness. He rises up on tiptoe under the critic's nose, all revelations, I said, turn to naught. Tick. The small man turns his head around like an owl. His gaze searches for a lightning rod and finds it in the form of the Comte. A grin spreads across his face. The Comte gasps. So I'm going to become famous? Do you really think it's going to happen? I'm sure of it, because beyond the light... Ion! A child's voice interjects. Ion, let's go already! A little boy, dressed in formal wear, stands by the door. You have to excuse me. The man squeezes the Comte's hand. It was an honor to meet a man whose head is the receptacle of sound so bright in their light. The memorial nature of the world becomes visible. Wait! The author winces. He pulls an ordinary pen out from the bottom of the inner breast pocket of his redding goat and uses it to autograph the dodecahedron. He's been practicing this for a long time. What name do I make this out to? Ion Rodionov, the man smiles. He's excited. You don't happen to be writing anywhere, do you? Oh, no, I'm not a critic, the man replies, his eyes sparkling with admiration. I'm a maths teacher. 
Who would have thought? Snaps the puffed-up critic by the door. But the teacher walks past him, paying him no mind. He takes the hand of the little student standing in front of the door. Come on, Ambrosius, he says. Isn't this a beautiful polyhedron? A month later, 800 kilometers from Revachal, at the edge of the Insulinde on La Zimonti des Bleus, the yacht's sail catches the wind with a vengeance. The canvas flaps at the howling of the wind is deafening. It's a night at the end of February, during Madrugada, the final dark blue hour before sunrise. The silver ocean lies beneath the dark blue expanse, a lone yacht maneuvering through its cracking ice sheet. An iceberg passes by the railing, steaming in the dark. On deck stands Comte Emile de Perouse Maitrecy. He's still in his black redding goat, which is unwashed and worn. The man's hairs flutter in the wind. His hands are red from the cold. They're frozen to the helm. Kill yourself, Revachol! Kill yourself! He roars into the wind. I know that it's tremendous, and the world knows that it's tremendous. Who even are you anyways? The ship crashes into the ice sheet. A deafening screech sounds against the wooden hull. With its teeth, the Comte tugs the cork from a bottle of spirits. Complicated? He growls and takes a swing. I will bring you the music of the spears. It's too complicated? You're complicated, you cow! In front of him, through the vast, ragged world, the sun rises. It is a vision. A bright gray light radiates in wisps as cold wreaths. The sun rises from the pale. The Comte thrusts his hand towards the sky, and the incomparable noise of time engulfs him. It's louder still than the wind, louder than the masses of ice rubbing against each other. The man's mouth sputters with drool, howling his favorite cadence. It's written by him, and the voice in the pale in front of him sounds like applause, standing ovations, the stamping of tens of thousands of feet, and whistles, deafening whistles, like those of fireworks, an atom that will someday be split in Revachal. The only thing in this world more beautiful than his own music is applause. I'm famous, booms the Comte. I am the most famous musician of all time. All other musicians are nothing compared to me. Nobody, nobody at all knows them, but they all know me. He necks the bottle of spirits and smashes it on the deck. Millions love me he exclaims, and deliriously throws his hands in the air towards the pale. Millions and billions, hundreds of thousands of billions of young girls in love. They love me and my twelve-tone melody. Love is everything. Love is light. Light and past that, nothing. Deleted Scene Khan's Mother Translator's Note this scene, found on Zaum's old Nihilist.fm blog, contains slight spoilers, introducing ahead of time certain elements that the text will treat as a surprise later on. It's probably why it was deleted, and we suggest reading it after you have finished the book. It does, however, add very interesting context and more depth of character to Khan and Khan's mother. Please, plump tears flow from under Inayat Khan's glasses. Tell me who you are. You know who I am. The vibration emits a child's voice. It says terrible things with it. Khan begins to shake. He slumps in the corner of the hall, telephone receiver in hand. It's not you. It's not you, he shouts. His real body shakes along with his mind. He wakes up crying in his bed. His ear throbs. 
The dream continues while he's awake, only that there is an airship model in the display case again. Nadia no longer smiles, and Gonsu is holding a compass. Five minutes later, Aliyah Khan wakes up to the clatter of dishes in the kitchen. She fumbles along the headboard of her bed, and a tasseled night lamp lights up. She goes to the kitchen in her nightgown. There, in the dark, with his back to the door, her son in his thirties stands sniffling. The big guy washes his coffee cup, his back shaking. Bad dream? Khan doesn't answer. He drops the cup in the sink, and the handle snaps off. Sit down. Let me do it. The mother leads the man to the table. Do you want me to make you some tea? Coffee. The man wipes his cheeks. Make some coffee. The old woman turns on the lights in the kitchen. The water sloshes in the sink as she washes her son's favorite mug. On it, Ramut Karzai's final journey winds through the dunes. Then she puts water on the stove and sits down next to Khan. I asked, he gasps, for her to tell me where they are, but she didn't say. And she was... Malin, Khan swallows. She called, and the others were there too. They told me to leave them alone. They said that I'm tormenting them. In the quiet, the kettle on the stove starts to whistle. Khan's mother gets up from the table and searches the cupboard for a coffee powder. You know what that means, right? Khan is no longer sniffling. He stares blankly at his fingers on the table. Everyone else would have gotten their own. I'd have been the only one who didn't... No, honey. Aliyah sets the coffee cup on the newspaper in front of her son. You're the one who's giving yourself advice like this. You yourself know what you have to do. You don't have to chase this Ziggy guy, and you don't have to go to the man who speaks with the dead. You have to get a job. But I already have a job. Khan takes a sip. I'm a leading specialist in my field. I've told you about it before. Maybe, yes, but this is not a normal field. I mean a real job. If you start taking care of yourself, women will come to you, too. I have an idea. Listen, in the morning, you go to the employment agency. Mom, didn't I just tell you? Let me finish. Bright and early in the morning, you go by and ask them for retaining and accept it. They offer it for free, after all. That'll give you some self-confidence, some structure. Of course, Khan laughs hollowly. Structure. And on Friday, you go out with this girl. She's up for it, and she's very nice. Agne is a very pleasant woman. I don't think her daughter will swallow you whole. What daughter? Why don't you ever listen to me? I've been telling you for a month now that my co-worker's daughter is your age and is also single. She actually really wants to meet you. Put on a nice suit and shirt and take her somewhere nice to eat. Khan lowers his head into his hands. Where would I take her, Mom? To Abu Babu's kebab? To eat burek? The place where I'll be getting that retaining? You know what we'll do? I'll give you some pocket money. An advance. Right after the employment agency, you'll make a reservation at Telefunken. Khan's mother watches him with a sly face. The man lifts his head from his hands and wipes his nose with a handkerchief. How are you going to make that happen? The mother splays open a newspaper on the table. Through your acquaintances? A young man in a t-shirt and a suit cut to his waist is posing next to his interview in the culture section in the newspaper. The shirt features the iconic album cover of a well-known dance artist. The interior design of the renovated panoramic floor shines in the background. Thank you for listening to this recording of Sacred and Terrible Air by Robert Kurvitz. 
narrated by Thomas Franklin.